Hello. Hello, Claudine. Kumusta? Hello. Sir, kunting kaway naman dyan. Kumusta? Paki-on po ng mga videos. Hello, sir. Hello. Hi. Hello. Kunting kaway naman dyan. Hello. Kumusta, sir? To all our friends in Tacloban, in Salmar, maupay nga kulup, haiyong nga tanan. To all our friends, mga amigo, mga amiga, diha sa Southern Leyte, sa Biliran, sa Palumpon, kinsa pa ba? Katong mga bisdak sa Manako. Maying hapon ka na itong tanan. A pleasant Friday afternoon to all of us. To all our Zoom participants who are on board right now. To our FB Live and YouTube viewers, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Eastern Visayas. And Good welcome. afternoon, Eastern Visayas from the Palumpon Institute of Technology. And welcome to day six of our webinar series of the training workshop and course modules production for flexible learning in higher education institutions, which is brought to you through the efforts of the Content Development Committee under the Eastern Visayas HEI's Flexible Learning Management System Consortium. This is Dr. Claudine Igot, and I am your host for this afternoon session. At last, we are now in day six in our series of webinars. I am sure our participants in the, yes, I'm pretty sure that all of you, our participants in all SUCs in the region had gained a lot of insights from the various topics presented. For this afternoon, let us, Brace again ourselves for more learnings as we'll listen to another distinguished resource speaker who will share his expertise on the topic, evaluation and monitoring of course offerings, a reflexive account. At the onset, may inform everyone that right after our webinar, the closing program follows. So I do hope you will bear with us up to the last part of the whole session. Friends, allow me also to extend my, my cordial greetings to the pillars of this consortium, starting with, of course, our ever dynamic CHED commissioner, Commissioner Alvin Darilag, who is the brainchild of this consortium, to CHED Region 8 Regional Director, Dr. George Colorado, to the SUC presidents of Region 8, especially for those who are on board right now. We have Dr. Jude Duarte, the president of Lady Normal University and the chair of the Content Development Committee. Dr. Victor Kenyezu Jr. of Biliran Province State University and the chairperson of the consortium. And we also have Dr. Pearls Ivy Yepes of Southern Lady State University Dr. Edgardo Tulin of Visayas State University, Dr. Marilyn D. Cardoso of Summer State University, Dr. Cherry I. Ultra, University of Eastern Philippines, and Dr. Benjamin I. Picayo for Northwest Summer State University, Dr. Edmondo A. Camputo, Eastern Summer State University, and to our very own president, of course, of Palompan Institute of Technology, Dr. Norberto C. Olavides, who is also the co-chair of the Content Development Committee. To all of you, good afternoon. But before we start, first thing first, may I show you some netiquettes for us to observe. Okay, wait, sorry. Okay, thank you. Okay, so for our video conference etiquette, so we need to 
you know, to flash this for the end time for us to observe for a smooth flow of our webinar this afternoon. So first step is we have to test device compatibility. I'm pretty sure you have done this already since this is our sixth day of our webinars. Second, for the Zoom participants, please do not navigate on the screen share features. If we do so, we will be distracting our resource speaker. Third, be on time. Let us be on time. For this afternoon, as I have said earlier, we have two major activities, the webinar and the closing program. So in order for us to maximize our time, participants are encouraged to be on time. Fourth, Entry while the session is ongoing will not be approved. So sorry for that. Then next, mute our audio and video. Next spot, if videos are active, practice decency. Next, rename your profile. So this is for identification purposes. Next, Yes, this is the process on how to change your Zoom profile or to rename your profile. Next spot, wear proper attire. Okay, then next is avoid distractions, especially for our session this afternoon. Our resource speaker uh, prefers to have an interactive, um, interactive session. So he might be calling some of us. Next, speak only if recognized. So this is during the open forum or the Q&A. Then, tag out only at the end of the session. Okay, so we have to observe that. For our Facebook and YouTube viewers, here are your reminders. First, be kind and polite in asking questions and expressing comments, suggestions and our feedback on the common threads. Trolling is highly discouraged. Avoid capitalizing all the letters in your comments because it implies we're shouting. Double check your questions, comments, suggestions, and our feedback before posting. If the connection of the live coverage is unstable, transfer to another available platform. So prior to actions on the Facebook and YouTube pages of EVHEI, FLNSC, let us remember that this is a platform for educators. Okay, that's it. Since everyone is settled, at this point, may I call in Mr. Ryan N. Wenceslao, the program chair of the Bachelor of Arts in Communication here in PIT, to lead us for a prayer. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let us now put ourselves in the holy presence of the Lord, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us. We are truly grateful for them. Thank you for allowing us today to meet and share our knowledge and time with one another in this webinar series. May you extend your divine wisdom to our speaker so that he would be able to impart effectively his God-given knowledge to all of us. May he be blessed as he continues to bring his expertise to people who need them. Bless the participants as well so that they would be able to glean the vital information from this activity. May you bestow your blessings after this webinar, so that may, may we go out and spread what we learn in the spirit of your love and generosity. May this activity glorify your name forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. For us to recall the highlights of the previous webinar, that was actually last Wednesday, let me call in the chair of the Social Science Department, Mrs. Elvin M. Bate. Elvin? Pleasant afternoon to everyone. 
allow me to present the recap of the events that transpired during the ninth webinar series held last Wednesday, June 17th morning session. The Eastern Visayas Higher Education Institutions Flexible Learning Management System Consortium led the training workshop on course modules production for flexible learning in higher education institutions through a webinar series. On its ninth series, the Northwest Selmar State University, all the way from Kalbayag City, served as the host institution. Before the webinar proper, the preliminaries took place, starting off with the reminders of the video conference etiquette presented by Mr. Rexor Mabutai, NWSSU CAS faculty, the webinar moderator. This was followed by a prayer led by engineer Rio de Makiling, Dean, College of Engineering and Technology of NWSSU. A recap of the eighth webinar series with Dr. Juan Robertino Macalde of Simeo Enotech as resource speaker was given by Dr. Maria Lucille Doliado, Dean of the College of Education of NWSSU. The highly esteemed SUC president of Northwest Summer State University in the person of Dr. Benjamin Pecayo had the honor of introducing the resource speaker. A woman of incomparable passion in her field and with supreme standard of excellence, Dr. Marilyn Obinia Balagtas, university professor of Philippine Normal University created such a wonderful impact on the participants when she selflessly shared her expertise on designing student-centered assessment in flexible learning environments. Dr. Balagtas took up the session with highly engaging activities and motivating workshops. She connected well with her audience when she asked for audience participation in her pick pack boom game, which clearly set the mood for learning. At the very beginning, she highlighted that it is our role as educators to help, to help our learners aim for excellence. The participants were also given a test of prior knowledge. This was an effective way of knowing where the audience were coming from for her to be able to ensure that effective learning would surely take place. The activities clearly paved the way for her topic on assessment, which as of today is deemed a very crucial factor. Assessment, she says, is a component of instruction. It is an integral part of the learning process. Dr. Balagtas reminded that we as teachers should engage our students in decision-making as in terms of shared learning objectives, strategies, and assessment. For assessment to be objective, she highlighted that it should be student-centered. That is, it should capture what the student knows, can do, and values on a set of essential and quality learning, considering his or her needs, capabilities, and limitations. All teachers aim for effective teaching, hence assessment of learning, assessment for learning, and assessment as learning should be done religiously. It is also important to note that assessment is not the end goal of teaching. Dr. Balagtas repeatedly stressed that even if curriculum had been designed, even after IMs and assessment tools had been prepared, teachers must revisit their assessment. She reiterated the factors essential in devising student-centered assessment as follows. Purpose-driven, valid, reliable, authentic, fair or inclusive, accessible, continuous, holistic, balanced, and ethical. Moreover, she emphasized that there is no one size fits all in assessment and that there is no such thing as perfect assessment. That being said, she stressed that our assessment should complement with other assessment tools, which would vary from traditional to performance-based 
to portfolio assessment. The webinar was highly impressive and truly comprehensive. Thereafter, an open forum followed, after which was the awarding of Certificate of Recognition. This was presented by Dr. Jude A. Duarte, Leyte Uni Normal University President and Chair of the Content Development Committee. The webinar ended at 12.25 p.m. Thank you so much and have a pleasant day ahead. Thank you, Elvin, for such a very comprehensive recap. At this juncture, to formally introduce our distinguished resource speaker, may I give you to Dr. Virginia S. Beltran, PIT's Vice President for Academic Affairs. Thank you, Claudine. To the officials of the Commission on Higher Education, Chair Prospero de Vera, Commissioner Aldrin Darila, Director George Colorado and staff, the presidents of the SUCs in Region 8, committee chairs and members, faculty, my fellow educators, good afternoon. Our resource speaker this afternoon is a teacher, educator, in fact, a language specialist with a training, research, assessment, and consultancy department at Simeo Regional Language Center, or RELC, Singapore. Prior to joining RELC, he was a lecturer in the Department of English as an international language at Monash University, Melbourne, Australia. He was also a visiting teaching and research fellow at several different universities in Asia, where he worked with local tertiary educators in curriculum development. His scholarly works have appeared in international peer-reviewed journals, such as International Journal of Educational Research, Asian Englishes, RELC Journal, World Englishes, and Multilingual Education, and various edited books on language teaching and teacher education. He is the author of a monograph entitled, Teaching English as an International Language, Implementing, Reviewing, and Re-Envisioning re World Englishes in Language Education, which was published by Rutledge, Taylor, and Francis Group in 2018. Ladies and gentlemen, to talk on the topic, monitoring and evaluating curricular offerings, a reflexive account, please help me welcome our resource speaker this afternoon, Dr. Roby Marlina. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, can I get a yes, yes, okay. Um, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Can I just share the screen? Oops, I can't. Okay. Uh, let me just get this right. Try again, sir. Oh, okay. So. Can you see my PPT? Yes. Okay, I'll just do that. Okay. Now, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Robbie Malina uh, from Singapore, Simi RELC. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Jesse Barrett, I think one of the speakers at this consortium for recommending me to give a talk here. Um, and also I would like to thank Sir Orlando Vinculado for inviting me to participate in this uh, consortium and to give a talk on monitoring and evaluating curricula offerings or learning modules or instructional materials um, from a reflexive 
point of view or reflexive perspective. So it's a it's a great honor. Um, this talk is going to be it's going to go on for about two hours approximately, and then I will um, leave the rest for Q and A. Um, now, before I dive into the topic, uh, I just wanted to say a few words about our organization, uh, Simeo RELC, and I'm pretty sure that there are also, uh, you, you probably be aware, you're probably aware that there are Simeo centers in the Philippines as well, and I have uh, noticed that one of the, the speakers from the Simeo center uh, Innotech was uh, one of the speakers you know, at your consortium. So as you know that Simeo RELC, or Simio Center, it's not, a, it's not a university, but as you can see, it's an educational institution in Southeast Asia that works with educators in the ASEAN region or Southeast Asia with an aim to improve the quality of language education in their respective contexts. So um, in the Philippines, you've got the Simio um, Innotech that's on technology. In Singapore, we, are the, the, um, uh, we focus on language um, education. But from my experience, I don't just simply, uh, I don't just mainly work with language educators, but also educators in general, ranging from uh, primary school educators up to tertiary educators on a wide range of topics in education. Um, so I'm actually quite grateful uh, that I've been asked to talk about monitoring and evaluating learning modules or instructional materials because it is one of my is one of the areas that I'm passionate about. And as you can see, um, so these are uh, my published work. And as you can see, that my area is language education, and that's why I'm here in RELC. But language education is very broad. Uh, more specifically, I specialize in curriculum development in monitoring and evaluation. So these are uh, the things that I have been doing for the last uh, God knows how many years. So most of my publications, it came out of my classroom practices. It's, you know, it's more like how much I have been annoyed, basically, or troubled uh, by things around me. So that's kidding. But partially, it, it is quite true because, you know, um, I got frustrated about some things, so I've decided to write about it. Um, but also, these books and articles and uh, published works, they, they, they came out of my curiosity about what I do, about what I teach, about um, how others feel about the things that I have taught, about how others um, see things that I've delivered. So these are the, the products of the monitoring and the evaluation process that I have engaged in or I have been engaged in. So I will share a bit um, about my experiences of, of, of writing, of publishing throughout this talk as um, Sir Orlando would like me to share a little bit of my experiences um, as, a, as a book author. So I, I, would, I hope that that can um, inspire some of us to, um, to, to do uh, research um, in this area. So these are the institutions where I've worked, the places where I've monitored uh, and evaluated their learning modules. And these are the places where I got my modules monitored and evaluated. So I have been at both ends, the evaluator and the evaluatee, if such word exists. So actually before coming to RELC, uh, so as, um, uh, as I was, the, the way I was introduced, I, I was in Australia before. I was a university uh, lecturer there, so and I was made in charge of revamping um, an entire BA program, and you know, and also tried to 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 develop and revised eight learning modules, and I had to start from scratch, and that was not easy. It was a hard job. And that's why a lot of the stuff that I'll be sharing here are drawn from my experiences of having taught and having worked with colleagues from those institutions and from my experiences of monitoring and evaluating uh, modules in those institutions. 
Um, yeah, well, as you can see, uh, I've not had a chance to work with colleagues from the Philippines, so I do hope that that day will come. Um, so, in this reflexive talk, as you know that um, one of the speakers said that there's no one, there's no best assessment practice. There's no one size fits all, you know, there's no one practice that fits all contexts. Same thing here that I'm going to emphasize. So in this talk, I'll be sharing my experiences. I'll be sharing my um, knowledge. And of course, these, these, these are from based on my own experiences. Whatever that's covered in this talk, it should not serve as a, you know, the bed of Procrustes or the Procrustean, Procrustean bed on which you put on your local monitoring and evaluation process, because I haven't been in your context. I don't know what your context, the, the way you guys uh, monitor and then evaluate uh, your modules. Okay, so that's not the purpose of this talk. I'm not here to provide, you know, a magic wand that can um, help us all. Uh, but so the nature of this talk is dialogical, it's reflective, and it's reflexive means that I will share some of the lessons that I've learned from my local and international experiences of monitoring and evaluating curricular offerings and also some of my research. And also I'm open to some of the ideas, maybe later on during the Q&A, you can share some of your thoughts, you know, so that's why I call it reflexive because it means reflexive in a sense that I share my own reflections, but I'm also open to other experiences of, I'm sure that all of us as educators, we do monitor and we evaluate our curricular offerings pretty much every day, yeah? or pretty much in, in every lesson, you know, or, or at the end of uh, our teaching semester, we, we have to do it. We, 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 we continuously reflect on our curricular offerings. Yeah. So later on, maybe Q&A, some of the members of the audience can share their thoughts. So again, so these experiences that I've shared, it, it's up to you to decide what suits you and what are the things you can relate to. And also you can see, well, maybe these are not related to my context. These are, you know, these are um, not related. It's, it's not relevant. So, so please feel free to, to, to share. Um, so specifically in this talk, I will cover the following questions. So there's what, so what is monitoring? So I'll start from um, basic. What is monitoring? What is evaluating? Um, now, if you have been in the consortium um, since day one, you would have heard talks on how to design modules and instructional module materials from, you know, uh, Professor Jesse Barrett and other scholars in the field. Um, some have even talked about, you know, the outcome-based learning and the need to be, um, I call it learner-centric. So, so we 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 look at our learners and we we designed a module based on their needs. Now, if you're inspired by the talks. And then you decide to design a learner-centric module. So my talk will prompt you to think about and explore accountability of your module, relevance of your module. So is having a learner-centric module relevant? Is it accountable? Is it effective? Or simply whether or not the module is realistic? So that, that, that's what I'm going to cover today. So I'm going to start, as I said, with what is monitoring and evaluating? What do we monitor or what do we evaluate? Why do we monitor? Why is it important for us to monitor and evaluate our modules? How do we monitor? What are the common techniques that uh, lecturers or scholars, educators have used or have been using to monitor and evaluate their modules. And also, lastly, I will cover what are some of the issues, you know, because, um, and I will reiterate this later on, monitoring and evaluating process, it's not always smooth. There are other issues emerged when you want to monitor and evaluate um, a learning module or instructional materials. Okay, so 
Um, before I proceed, I like you to first of all reflect on your presence here. Why are you here? Why are you attending my talk? It's one o'clock. It's or one thirty. Uh, it's after lunch, so people are getting sleepy. So. <laughs> What is the purpose of listening to my talk? What, 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 what is the purpose behind it? What are you trying to, to gain from this talk? And what do you wish to have gained from my talk and how? Okay, so I'll give you, just to think about these questions, I'll give you about one minute. So if you look at the bar down there, the yellow bar, when it disappears, I will move on to the next slide, okay? So think about these questions. I hope the bar is moving. I hope we're thinking of some of these questions. Okay, thank you. Thanks for uh, reflecting on these questions because later on, I will come back to these questions at the end of my talk because the reason why I put out these questions is because I would like to engage you in monitoring your own um, learning or, you know, why, why you're here. Okay, so we start with monitoring and evaluation. What is it? What is monitoring? What's evaluation? And how do we define, you know, these uh, two terms? Are they, are they the same? Are they different? Um, in what way are they, are they different? In what way are they the same? So I would like to know um, your understanding of monitoring and evaluation. I really like to, because I don't want to assume that you've never monitored or evaluated your learning modules. So, because we're all here educators. So I'd like to know what you think of what monitoring is, of what evaluation is. So can you please take out your phone? Okay, so now you can use your phone. Uh, but of course, I, I would appreciate your contribution here. I like to, I like you to share your thoughts. Maybe you can scan this QR code. If you don't have a QR code scanner, you can go to this um, link. Can you please do that for me? Either scan that QR code, or you go to that link. And then those of you who have um, managed to go into the to the site, so you might see that. And then I'd like you to click on the plus. And then you add your thoughts. So what, what's monitoring, what's evaluation, and then you click on post. And then I'll be able to see what everybody um, says, what monitoring is and what evaluation is. Okay, so please scan this QR code. And or if you don't have a scanner, you please go to the um, that link there. Great. I can see people are typing. Great. I have another screen here so I can see what people are saying. Okay, it's uh, important processes to ensure desired outcomes are achieved. Yep, fabulous. That's great, demonstration of learning, fully agree, yes. Aha, uh -huh. looking at effects of intervention and plan and program. That's, that's great. Keeping track of your students, see where they are heading, yes. OK, 
Okay, that's great. Monitoring is systematic. Yep. Can I give you guys maybe five minutes to do this? So if you see the bar there, I will um, end the activity and we will we'll have a discussions. Great. Wow, lots of lots of um, comments. Fantastic. Okay. Monitoring performance of your students, looking at your students' um, progress. Yes. Evaluation is how we Okay. Okay, some people talk about quality of your delivery. Monitoring is tracking. Fantastic. Tracking uh, the state of the student's output, yes. Excellent. If you have finished um, posting, you can refresh, you know, the the screen or the page, and you'll be able to see other people's comments. And because it acts like Facebook, you can like it. Uh, but what makes it different from Facebook, you can dislike it. But please don't do that. Um, so you can like the comments. Uh, those who share similar views as you. So have a look at other people's comments. You can like it. Okay, monitoring is answers if you're going according to the plans. Evaluation is what went right, what went wrong. Okay. We have a few more minutes to go. Ooh, controlling. Wow. Controlling and reassessment. Oh, I like the, the, the word reassessment. Yes, it's not just simply assessing, but reassessment. Yeah. Fabulous. Okay, so evaluation Travis's from, okay, from. Great, great. Ah, I like this uh, definition here. Monitoring is the process of routinely gathering information. Okay. Okay, so a few more minutes to go. If you haven't, if you have already finished, as I said, please refresh the page and then like the ones that you agree with if you can see it. Mm -hmm. That's fabulous. Okay, so monitoring is more on observation of activities while evaluation is giving feedback on the activities. Okay, so one is observation, the other one is giving uh, feedback. Okay, great. Okay. It's a kind of ongoing exercise. Yep, evaluation is done at the end of a period, okay? So monitoring is ongoing, evaluation is periodic, like at a particular time, um, set time. Okay, great. Monitoring is very useful, yes. Ah, you polish. Monitoring is proactively polishing the output while work in progress. Okay. Okay. 
That's great. Monitoring is very useful, of course. Both, I think monitoring and evaluation, they are both are very useful, not, yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so I think time's up. Um, so you can still post if you want to, but what I can see is that um, a lot of you think that monitoring is an ongoing in nature. It's continuous whereas evaluation is periodic. So at a particular time, you want to see, you know, um, what went right, what went wrong, um, what needs to be evaluated. Yes, so let, let's, let's, let's just um, have a look at what has been um, discussed here. So monitoring, if I can put in, 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 in a research phrase, it's like it's an ongoing data collection. You go out there, you collect information about something, about your students learning, about your teaching, about, you know, whether your content is sort of up to date and whether it's trendy enough. So you are collecting data, collecting information as you go. So it's progressive. Now, this, this, this one uh, definition here is I mean, that's why I put a little question mark there. It's collecting and analyzing information undertaken whilst the module is being delivered. So I put the question while. So the reason why I put a question mark there, uh, or maybe I'll come back to that a, a bit later. Let me just finish this um, slide first. So uh, another way of um, understanding monitoring, so in the, in the case of uh, learning modules, is knowing whether your module is happening the way it was planned, okay? So basically, as I said, as a lot of you have said, um, it's ongoing, it's checking the progress, um, make, making sure that you are on the right track. Yes, you're collecting information. The reason why I put while, let's go back to the second point there. So do we only collect and analyze information whilst the module is being delivered. So does it mean that we stop collecting information after it's been delivered? So this is, this is the kind of um, question because I'm reflecting on my experiences um, and even um, currently I, I, I'm involved in several projects on you know, curriculum and uh, materials uh, evaluation and monitoring. So, even now, I am still thinking about whether you know the curriculum is sort of um, is matching the standards. So even even I mean some some of the projects are already over, finished already. But does it mean I've stopped monitoring? Okay, so something for us to think about. So evaluation. So how is evaluation different from monitoring? So as many of you have said, monitoring is ongoing. It's a progress. Evaluation is when you want to know the quality. Have you achieved what you wanted to achieve? The quality of the program, the quality of the module. So knowing about you know, the strengths and weaknesses of the module, knowing about areas that you need to improve. Okay, knowing how much impact that you have made. So you look at the outcomes, you look at the stuff that your students produce. Okay, what are they like before? And what are they like after studying your module? What have they produced? Any changes in thoughts, any changes in their behaviors, any changes in their actions? Can they do something that they couldn't do before learning your module? Okay, and also evaluation, when you evaluate your module, it's about the values of your module. So in light of the outcomes, in light of the changes that you see in your students, is it worth delivering this module again next time? Is it worth it? Should we do it again? Should we offer this module again? Okay. So Evaluation looks at the overall impression of the module. Okay. All right. So 
So these are the two definitions of um, monitoring and um, evaluation. So I'd like you to monitor, to evaluate your own definition. So in light of what you've said, are we sharing similar views here? Um, yes, no, somewhat. Perhaps you can type your response in the chat box on your right. I mean, it's on my right, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe it's on your left. Um, so can you type your response? Because I wanted to see, I'm actually monitoring as well at the same time. I'm monitoring my own um, presentation to see uh, whether you and I share or whether we are sharing similar views of uh, monitoring and evaluations. Can you please type your, your, your responses? I'll, I'll have a look at it in the chat box. So yes, no, somewhat. Mm. So that little yellow box is my, uh, yes, okay. Mm. So yes, yes. No, I don't see your responses in the chat box. If you can write it in your chat box, please. Yes, yes. Wow, a lot of yeses. Nice, thank you. Okay, great. So seems to me that we are sharing um, similar views here. Um, that, 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 that's great. Okay, but then I'd like to move on to some of the issues that, that, um, that are highlighted here. Oops, sorry, I've got lots of messages um, from Padlet here. Kept on telling me. Okay, so you can stop the Padlet now. We don't need it anymore. Sorry, just give me a second. I need to stop. Okay, all right. Okay, so thank you for your input. So is monitoring, the, this, is, this is where I wanted to go back to um, the issue that I raised earlier. Is monitoring the same as evaluation? Is it synonymous? Are they the same or are they different? Now, some scholars, they look at, these are the questions that we ask when we monitor. So we wanted to know, are we getting there? How are we getting on? See, because monitoring, so it's a progressive, uh, even, even the, the, the tenses here, monitoring. So are we getting there? Are we getting, how are we getting on? Um, you know, are we there yet and how? Whereas evaluation is we look at the end result. Have we got there? Have we been sensible? I don't want to use the word, have you, so, so, some scholars like to, you know, ask the question, have we done the right thing? You know, what is right? It, it doesn't apply to, to, to all contexts, really. So I, I like to use the word sensible and justifiable because, you know, we have, uh, every context is, is different. So every module is, is also different. So, so these are the, the sort of um, distinctions that, that people make. And another distinction that people have made in terms of monitoring and evaluation is monitoring it has a formative nature. So it's developmental, it's diagnostic, it's continuous, as many of you have, you have said, it's, uh, it's ongoing, you know, um, it's finding out where you are, whereas uh, evaluation, it's more of a, has a summative nature, and that's when we look at the end result. But really, the question is, that i like all of us to think about is, when you finish evaluating something, does it mean our job is done? Does it mean it's over, it's finished? There, when it says at the end, so what, what, after you have finished evaluating your materials, say, yes, you can see um, the, 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 the strength, you can see the weaknesses, you can see, you know, that's why we have the areas that need improvement section. So if you say that you, you now know what has gone right, what has gone wrong, that's it? 
it's over? Do we not need to continue? So this is where um, it can be quite tricky because uh, the way I see this is monitoring, the, the, the sort of difference of monitoring and valuation, it conveys a, a problematic binary you know, view of teaching and learning. It does not um, look at monitoring as continuous. It does not look at assessment as a continuous process. You know, as I said, as teacher, we make decisions, you know, um, every single second. We monitor, you know, what we teach. We monitor our content. We evaluate it continuously, constantly, you know, on a regular basis, even, you know, on a daily basis, every second, every minute. So, I even, so when I was evaluating something, I also ask myself, uh, you know, when I'm monitoring a curriculum, I also ask myself those evaluative questions. Have I got there yet? Have I been sensible? You know, so it's often not that clear cut. That's why a lot of um, lecturers or scholars in this area, they, they, they look at it, they, they use these two um, things interchangeably. I, however, Look at monitoring and evaluation as it's ongoing, it's dynamic, and it's continuous. Okay, so it's like a it's like a it's a complex cycle. It really depends on your purpose of doing it. Are you trying to see the end result, or are you trying to see end result at that particular moment in time? Okay, so it really depends on your purpose. It's a I call it monitoring and evaluation as a reflection in action and on action. Okay, reflection in action is you are doing it as you go. On action is you are looking at, you know, what are you doing? What 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 the the, the learning modules, the teaching, the um, the content, the students learning, the learning transfer, you know whatever, any activities that's going on there, the assessment practices, the rubrics, et cetera. Okay, so it's a, it's a form of action research. If you want to put it in a, um, in a research term, it's similar to action research, okay? So as I said, the reason why it is a complex cycle is because, you know, okay, monitoring, as you said, it's ongoing. So you find out what's going on and you make a plan and who knows, after you watch and listen, you're not going to go back to thinking, you're not going to go straight or proceed to thinking and discussions. You may want to find out more. You may want to make more plans. Yeah? You might, may want to make more things to happen before you go to discussions. So it's, it's never ending. Okay? And it's very complex. It, it, it's not as neat as this circle, it's a complex cycle and it's dynamic. And the reason why it's dynamic is because knowledge is dynamic, people are dynamic and teaching and learning are also dynamic processes. So it's never ending, whether we like it or not. That's, that's, that's in our profession as educators. Okay, so that's monitoring and evaluation, as I said. So it's reflection in action and on action. All right, why do we monitor? Why are we monitoring? Why do we monitor? Why do we have to evaluate? Why can't we just design the modules, design the instruction materials and just teach it? Why do you think that we need to monitor and evaluate our modules? Maybe, can you share, I mean, those of you who are in the Zoom, um, can you share your thoughts, perhaps, you know, a few sentences or just one sentence, one keyword in the chat box, like why are we monitoring? Why are we evaluating? Please. So why do we need to monitor? Why do we need to evaluate our modules? Any, uh, any reasons why? Okay, ensure it conforms to the desired objectives. Ensure learning, yes. To make sure that students are learning something from us, yes. Okay, anything else?
evaluate to see if it fits the needs of our students. Yes, agree. Again, I, I like this, um, how you are, you know, it's a learner centric um, comment I like that. And to take corrective actions. Yes, as we see deviations. Okay, great. So if it diverge, um, diverges from our intended, so you have to take actions to make sure that it goes back to the, the right uh, or more sensible um, path. Okay, checking the effectiveness of the modules. Yes, you want to know if it is effective. You want to know whether they've learned something out of it. I mean, your students learn something out of it. Okay, great, thank you for that. So now there are um, three reasons. Okay, okay, so if I can come back to this. All right, so first of all, for justification and accountability. The reason why we monitor, we evaluate our modules is because we want to make sure that we are offering something that is credible. We want to make sure our instructional materials are legit. Yeah, especially when we need to have, or when we need to get a stamp of approval from those who have authority over us, yeah? And of course, not just that, but really we want to deliver a um, module that is justifiable and accountable and it's legit, okay? So secondly, monitoring, the reason why we monitor as many of you have shared, we want to improve. Knowledge is dynamic, as I said, teaching and learning are both dynamic processes. So we want to make continuous improvement yeah um the reason why you know when i was when i was teaching um back in australia the reason why i was put in charge of um, revamping the entire ba program uh specifically in 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 language and and applied linguistics is because the earlier version um was not up to date was no longer um, sort of, I mean, students did not see, um, you know, the, the need for it. Students have been complaining, saying that, um, you know, they, 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 they couldn't um, benefit, you know, from the earlier module. So that's why I was put there and I was asked to revamp the entire BA program and then propose modules that students would probably find it useful. So really it's for improvement. Yeah, so monitoring and evaluating is for you to see how your module is doing, how your program is doing, are we progressing well, any um, corrective actions that need to be taken to make sure that we don't deviate, uh, as some of you have shared, and to explore what work, what don't, to see whether our teaching strategies, our modules, our content, do students like it or do or they don't. Okay, and find out where we can um, improve. Okay, so I mean, you know, what, what one thing that we can probably think about because I, I looked at the um, other plenary papers, um, you know, a lot of us, uh, a lot of the, the, the scholars talk about ICT integration, you know, technology enabled learning. It's a big thing. It's, 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 it's everywhere. In Singapore, people will ask, you know, if you have, if you integrate technology in your module, if students will learn something using technology, will they do it? You know, so monitoring and evaluation is, this is when you see whether you can incorporate or you can't incorporate. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a way for you to find out you know, because ICT is a is a is a is a trend, so you wanted to find out if your module is trendy or not trendy. You know, and how do you catch up to the trend, and what do you think you can uh, do to catch up to the trend? Okay, so that's improvement. And the last one, the reason why we, or the reason why um, a lot of the scholars, we monitor evaluate modules is for knowledge and practice advancement. What does that mean? It means you want to prevent your materials from becoming obsolete, meaning 
old and outdated. You want to be trendy, as I said. You want to teach content that is relevant to today's globalization era or 21st century. Yeah, you wanted to make sure that it is up to date. But most importantly, it's to develop a climate of inquiry. Yeah, it's a climate of research. It's a climate of wanting to do better, wanting to produce better learning. Okay, so sometimes monitoring and evaluating modules, these sort of activities can be turned into research. And this is what we call classroom research in action. So you want to, you know, sometimes I'll tell you, when I was monitoring and evaluating um, modules and it's, there, there are things that annoy me. There are things that, that frustrate me. And there are things that, but sometimes, you know, uh, there are things that are quite inspirational as well. You know, so I, I kept on getting these questions. You know, I kept on asking myself these questions. This is annoying. This is inspiring. But sometimes you want to get heard. You want to people to know your stories. You share it in a form of publication. Okay, because writing articles sometimes is not necessarily, um, you know, um, a test, you know, or an experiment. It can be a process, a journey. Sometimes you just wanted to share that frustrations. But as you are sharing, you are also engaged in reflection. You are also engaged in inquiring into practices. But all of these is for you to improve your um, teaching and learning, the, the quality of teaching and learning in your, in your respective context. Okay. So these are the three reasons as to why people monitor and why we evaluate our modules. So now you know what monitoring is. Now you know what, why we monitor. So we come back to the what, okay? So what do we monitor, actually? What do we monitor? What are the specific things so let's say when you're monitoring something when you're monitoring a module an instructional module what are the things that you focus on okay so again i like you to share your thoughts here so take your phone scan this code or you go to uh, you visit this link and you'll be prompted to key in two things and please focus on keywords only okay what are the two things that you focus on when you monitor or when you evaluate a module please Uh, it's not here anymore, it's here. Great. Right, so we look at content. Oh. 
Okay, a lot of us say content, activity. Okay, that is great. Okay. That's great. Okay, I'll give you guys one more minute to go. Okay, great. Okay, five more minutes, five more seconds. Five, three, two, one. Now voting is closed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your um, contribution. Now, as you can see, a lot of us choose content. Yeah, we also, we want, we're looking at our content. We're looking at the effectiveness. We're looking at relevance, progress, quality. Oh, well, some say difficulties. That's probably, um, yeah, okay. So these are some of the specific things that you monitor when, you, um, when you're evaluating and monitoring uh, a module. Okay, great. Now let's go back to my talk. Okay, so there are actually three things. So of course they are all, um, you know, great input. Okay, but let me summarize them, put them together. So you want to see, you monitor the learning transfer. Okay, whether your content facilitates that transfer. You want to see quality of teaching. Now, content is or falls into the, the, the whole category of quality of teaching, the quality of your content, the quality of your teaching strategies. And then I'll take you to the bigger um, thing that you look at is also alignment. Some of you talked about relevance. Yes, that's correct. That's great but also relevant to what? Effectiveness, but effective in what sense? You talk about outcomes. Some of you said outcomes and quality. What kind of quality? What kind of outcomes? Okay, I will go through these, um, these each of these one by one. So in terms of the learning transfer and quality teaching, when we're evaluating and monitoring um, uh, a module, what kind of questions do you ask? Okay, so some of you said relevant. So is it relevant to the student's needs? Learner-centric again. But also, is it relevant to the employment landscape? When they graduate from your um, program, after they've completed your module, will they be able to work well in the society? Is it effective? Some of you have said that. Is it practical? Sometimes our modules, what we teach are too theoretical, too abstract, where students need something concrete. So is there a bridge between theory and practice? So can they practicalize, operationalize the theoretical um, frameworks or concepts or notions that, that you've, you, you've taught them in the modules? Is it sustainable? Can your modules be offered again and produce similar results? 
consistent. That's when I say relevant, consistent. Is it consistent with societal or institutional values? Okay. So I'm going to, um, to, to address those in a minute. So in terms of learning transfer, there are four, um, what do they call it? There, there are four ways of exploring, you know, whether or not learning has been transferred. First one, this is a very quick way for you to find out whether your module is great or relevant. Look at students' reaction. How do they react to your module? Okay, this is the first initial reaction that students have. So just in general, do they like it? Do they not like it? So strength and weaknesses of your modules. Okay, so reaction, their reactions. So good, eh, eh, or okay. All right, so first reaction. Learning, what specific skills, knowledge, attitudes that they've gained from your module and to what extent have they gained it okay so really matching um, your modules aims and objectives with their achievement okay now when it comes to uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, research and practices these two are the most common ones that um, teachers do but i would like to encourage you to think to take it to the next step results results here i don't mean you know what they've learned but can they transfer what they've learned from your module to the outside world because you're talking about relevance earlier some of you have put relevance some of you have put effectiveness so when you say a module has been effective, it's not necessarily just something that they've learned, but can they use it in the outside world? So the pro, the BA program that I was asked to um, to 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 revamp back in Australia, uh, the earlier program, they said that they've learned something, but they can't use it in the outside world. So they, they've learned, um, it, it's, it's a language program, so they learn how to survive linguistically at a university, but professionally, they're not sure. So this is where, um, you know, the evaluators uh, came in and, and evaluated the entire module. So can they use what they've learned from your module in the outside world later? And then the last one, this is a little bit um, tough, but it can be done. Some, you know, educators and uh, university professors have actually done it. This is to look at how does society respond to the knowledge and the skills that the students um, have gained from your module? Any benefits? Any impact? What impact has, does it have or has it had on the society. So let's say that they've learned um, how to, you know, deliver a, a presentation. So that skills of delivering presentation, that knowledge of present, uh, that, that knowledge of, you know, uh, the know-how of presentation skills, is it beneficial to the society? And how does society respond to that? Yeah. So. Again, as I said, these are some of the things that we can look at, you know, um, but, but as I said, you know, sometimes where after you've designed um, a module, you know, and you get, and then you, you, you've told, you share this with your colleagues, you know, uh, from another department, I, I, I did that. So after I've, I've, I've designed a module, of course, you get enthusiastic, you shared it with other um, colleagues from other departments or colleagues from your department and, Sometimes they would ask you, okay, so that sounds great, but, you know, is it useful? Do the students like it? Do the students find it useful? So you do get annoyed. You do get, get um, frustrated sometimes. So I get, I get these questions a lot. So after you've, 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 you've done something, you get these questions a lot. So to address this question, write about it. So I got 
um, quite frustrated, you know, after I've designed the modules and after I've revamped the program, I want to, uh, and people asked me, so do people see that, do the students like it? Do they, do they, do they enjoy learning that particular program? I said, I don't know. They said, well, in that case, we may have to reconsider your, your, your module, you know, in the future. So I thought, okay, you know what? I'm going to find out. I'm going to do research. I'm going to find out what my students think their reactions, their learning. So that's why I've decided to conduct um, a very small scale research, just simply asking the students, actually from three students, you know, but of course this is um, not just in one day, it's over um, three years actually. It's a long, longitudinal um, study. Or actually not three years, some of them there's only one year. So just in depth about what they think. So do you, do you see the need um, of you know, learning this particular program um, or what, what do you think? So something very simple. So you can turn your monitoring and evaluation practices into a publication, okay? Into research to find out what they think. And as I said, when we are, um, evaluating our module, we also want to make sure that our module is legit, our module is accountable. One way to find out is to do something similar to this. Yeah. Okay, so earlier, we've, we look at learning transfer. Okay, so you've, you monitor um, how the students receive your module. The next one is quality of teaching. So what are the specific things that you monitor when it comes to the quality of teaching? Okay, this one you look at topics, or as some of you, actually a lot of you have said content, okay, your teaching. So, oh, sorry, sorry, before teaching, the sequence of the topics. What, how are you you know, um, how do you guide students learning? Okay, so not just simply the, I mean, the content, yes, but the sequence, what comes first, what should be taught next, and what's after that, okay? And also pedagogical sequence as well, your teaching strategies, how do you excite students? As you said, you wanted to, uh, you, you've learned about outcome-based learning, you know, learner-centered, learner, learner -centered, um, you know, teaching. So how, what are the, the, the strategies and is it useful? Teaching resources, this is important. We've learned, I mean, you've, you've learned about ICT integration, um, how to integrate um, technology into teaching, okay? So any resource available? What about libraries? What about, do, the, do you allow phones in the in classrooms? Um, do you allow them to Google things, you know, whilst you are uh, delivering lessons, you know? Assessment tasks, rubrics, you know? So what do you assess? And you wanted to make sure, you wanted to see whether whether your um, assessment tasks are relevant to the students' needs, effective, so prepare them for uh, the future, uh, whether it's practical, whether they can, you know, use it outside, um, outside the classroom, whether it's sustainable and whether it's consistent, okay? So a research approach like this, you could call it intervention study or comparative analysis. So intervention study is when you try to intervene, you, you come up with a new teaching strategy and then you implement it in a classroom and then you evaluate to see if it works or it doesn't, okay? So, um, so sometimes when I say the quality of teaching or teaching strategy, sometimes it's not just your own teaching strategies. Sometimes it can be the teaching strategies imposed by the others, set by, for example, your head of department or your um, your dean. Okay. So, so for for example, I mean, in Australia. I can share a little bit about my experience again and how these leads to um, monitoring and evaluation and then eventually uh, a, a, pub, a publication. So I was I was brought up 
in Indonesia. I grew up in Indonesia. I was born in Indonesia. Um, but then I went to Australia uh, when I was 14 and 15. And, you know, and I, because, well, when I was in Indonesia, there were certain classroom norms and there's certain teaching strategies and you're expected to behave in a particular way. Um, but then when I was in Australia, it was a completely different um completely different norms, completely different teaching practices, completely different teaching strategies, you know. So until I took up a, a teaching position at an Australian university, I was told that, you know, you need to assess students' oral contribution in a classroom. They need to be talkative. They need to share their thoughts and you need to um, assess that. You, you're given grades. So in the assessment um, tasks summary, participation or oral contribution gets a percentage and it counts towards uh, the end, uh, your, your, your final grade. I was shocked because I was quite shocked because when I was in, um, as a student in Indonesia, I know this was way, I mean, long, long, long time ago. Um, a good student is someone who, well, back then, a good student was um, a student who listened, you know, attentively, who did not, you know, who only answered when being asked, especially when being pointed, you know, uh, by the teacher. But then in Australia, again, the, the imposed teaching strategy is that you need, other the imposed teaching method is you need to, um, students have to be active. And as teachers, you need to make sure that they talk. You need to make sure that they contribute. They talk, they just talk, they just talk. Yeah. So again, but then we have different norms. We have different cultural practices. So I was quite shocked when other colleagues of mine complained saying that, well, your teaching, haven't, your, your teaching hasn't been effective because the students are very quiet. But actually, I know that they're not quiet. I know that they are mentally participating, okay? But I can't justify that. I cannot go to my colleagues and say, actually, they're thinking, you know, um, they, 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 they're mentally engaging with me. You know, but I, I, I don't have any proof, evidence. So what do I do? I publish, I go and do research. I go out and ask them. I ask my students, okay? So I ask them, why are you not talking in class? Why are you not participating in class? So I'm monitoring, evaluating. Is it because of me? Is it because of the content? Is it because of the learning modules, the topics? What's wrong? You know, or, or what's right? Or what have I done wrong? And then I found out there's more to that. Um, you know, silence in a classroom, you know, and it really, um, well, from here, I can go and say, well, by the way, you know, the module or the teaching strategy is legit or is accountable because of this. Okay. So this is just, um, as I said, you know, uh, this is a, a result of monitoring and, and evaluation. Now, the last one is alignment. Okay. What are we aligning ourselves with? Okay. When you say aligning yourself, alignment, aligning with what? This is really important because this is also how we justify the accountability of our modules. But again, aligning yourself with what? How do you know, once again, that your modules are legit? How do you know? So I'll share again another experience of mine of designing a module for, um, I mean, for, 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 for the university where I was before. So this is a module on professional writing. And in this module, so the, basically the synopsis is, it equips students with knowledge of language used in the professional context. The learning outcomes, I hope, by the end of the module, they demonstrate the ability to write a direct opening statement to communicate um, their, you know, their aim succinctly, and they be able to use succinct and clear language. And this is how the module is structured. This is just a rough 
um, picture of of the of the module, but it's 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 the main thing. So in this module, I teach them how to write an opening salutation. I teach them how to write a body paragraph, closing salutation, appropriate language. Okay, and the assessment tasks. Uh, it's a I get them to I give them a case study. Okay, so a company is asking them to um, to write something. So it's a business correspondence because it's a you know professional writing. So they need to be able to uh, to be able to produce a professionally written letter or emails or whatnot. Okay, so the grading in terms of the assessment rubrics. Um, Accuracy is one, clarity is one, and appropriateness is another one. Then I submit my this module, which I think is woo, it's great. Submit it to the dean, submit it to the faculty, and then went to the universities. Then I got knocked about and said, "I'm sorry, I don't think you can. I can. I would allow you to um, to do this. I would allow you to offer this module." I thought, "What is going on?" And they asked me this question. So when you get them to use language in professional context, do you think that it's realistic? Do you think it reflects how people write in reality? So I thought, mm, yeah, not sure. So this is what I imagine. So when I was designing this module, I imagined, we have a lot of imaginations. We, we imagine as we go, yeah? We want to know, ah, you know, after learning this module, they can write this, they can do this. But have we checked with reality? How do people write in reality, in realistic context? Okay, so that's one. And the, the university dropped another bomb um, to my office and asked me, well, I'm sorry, you cannot offer this, um, module is because have you thought about the internationalization of curriculum initiatives? So I thought, what's wrong with that? So they said that, well, I'm sorry, um, our mission and visions, we, we want to internationalize our curriculum, but unfortunately your module does not broaden, so to speak, in a student's horizon. It does not um, allow students to, um, you know, to, to learn how to write for international audience because it's very vague, okay? So what are they questioning? What do you think that they're questioning? They're questioning the values. They were saying, it's great but do we need it? Is it preparing students for the actual communication practices in the world? So it's not just for, um, or is it in line with the university's mission and vision? And of course, this is just in a language um, course, but if you think about uh, courses in your own context, this is what, what I mean by alignment. Is your module aligning itself with these values, okay, with um, realities. So these are the components of our modules, okay. We have a title, we have a synopsis, we have learning outcomes, we have module topics, assessment tasks, etc. Yes, this is what we perceive students will need. But have we done a reality check? Okay, so from my experience, from what I've learned, we need to know that our module is not a separate entity that operates independently from other things around us. Module, our learning modules, our instructional modules are part of what I like to call educational ecosystem. There are many things, many factors that we need to take into consideration when we design and when we monitor and evaluate our module. Um, Again, going back to that uh, particular module that I that I uh, that I developed, and also at that time was monitoring it as well. Um, the university sort of sent an alert saying that Bachelor of Arts program in Australia are at risk. Why? Because they they started questioning. Because arts, you know, humanities and social sciences, they started asking, what can the students do 
after they graduate because I, i'm not sure about the philippines context but in australia back then um i'm talking about i'm talking you know uh six or seven years ago when i when i was when i was there they 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 started questioning so these uh, knowledge that you've you, you've imparted what can they do in reality what can they do after they graduate how can they use these modules in an industry in a in an in an organization how is it useful so it's a so they they've started introducing these industry based uh program so every arts or every module within the faculty of arts had to have that industrial element so students will need to be able to relate or when when you're designing your module you need to be able to make sure that what you design and what the the requirements of the industries you need to be able to match them okay so as i said and also the internationalization of education or curriculum the university where i was before is big on that they 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 want to internationalize they don't want us to just teach australian content they want the students to be able to use the content in international um, context so if you design a module that is not in line with that particular values it gets scraped so that's what i said um, earlier course modules um, that are part of the educational ecosystem we need to ensure that we take into account some of those um, i call it major forces that influence the accountability of your module so to show you um, the diagram this is what your module is okay this is where the content the pedagogy and the assessment and when it comes to alignment as i said of course your module is offered within the course and your course is offered within the department or the faculty and the faculty is under the university so you have got to make sure that the mission the vision the values the paradigms of these three forces are being taken into account especially when you're monitoring on evaluating your module how are you Ill yes we have to understand the students needs but we also need to look at these values as well yeah so it's a complex factor and also the contextual needs the employment landscape so what's out there are we offering are we teaching are we um, when, when we're teaching are we just simply imparting content and topics and um you know um theories to the students but then are we doing this are we preparing um students for um reality okay so when you are monitoring your uh so this is in practice especially when you're monitoring evaluating your curriculum or your learning uh instructional materials uh, in terms of their alignment, there are two ways, okay? So top-down approach, basically you look at the outside world, does the outside world provide you with enough basis to develop your module, to justify the accountability of the module that you've developed? Does the university support you? does the faculty are there enough resources available in the department in the faculty in the program that help you dis uh, that help you you know develop um, your module okay or that help provide or support learning um, in the curriculum offerings another way of course top down that's bottom up looking at your content to see if it is in line with the missions the visions of the universities to see if it prepares students for the necessary skills required in the outside world okay so again you know um again a, a publication that came out of this was i try to see okay because again the, the 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 university or we lecturers are under pressure we're under pressure in what way we're under pressure because you know as i said well, where i was before there's no if if your programs are not in line with the university's um initiatives and not in line and do not have any 
outside world implications, you are out, man. You know, so that's what I've decided. Okay, fine. Let me um, try to do content analysis. And this is what I looked at my contents and I look at my programs, look at the modules, look at the offerings and see, okay, how does these academic program here, how does my program fits into or um, respond to the globalization of the, the requirements, the employment landscape in the era of globalization? It's okay, so that's the outside world. So um, increased human mobility and, 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 and advancement in technology, et cetera. So how, how is that or how are those incorporated into my academic program? And internationalization, that's the university. Okay, so from something big to something um, in the middle. So internationalization of curriculum. How does my program or how do my modules respond to the internationalization uh, initiatives okay so again this is once again um is to to make sure that your modules are legit and in order for us to survive otherwise we'd be asked to uh, shut down basically so a lot of the um the lecturers as, as you can see that it's it, it, it's not it's not a, a happy process or a, a, a smooth process lots and lots of things are going into the whole um monitoring and evaluation process Okay, so the last one, how? Oh, no, not the last one. There's another one um, after this. So we look at the how. What are the, when it says how, what are the techniques to monitor and to evaluate your modules? How do you know, how do you find out whether your module is okay and whether your module is sensible? How do you find out? How do you, uh, what are the common techniques? Of course, we know that, um, you know, this is very commonly um, employed. We use survey, we use um, questionnaire, and, you know, just, just to find out um, what they think, what our students think, yeah? So I think that most of us uh, probably are familiar with this. These are from two different institutions. One is uh, where I am currently, and this is where I was um, before. Okay, so again, I just wanted to find out from your context, okay, what are the common techniques to monitor and evaluate modules? Okay, so apart from survey, of course, survey is one of them. So. I actually, I like to find out. Now I'm going to do another. Uh, this is the last activity for um, for my talk before before I end it at about three something. So you'll be shown a list of techniques, okay? So I will show you. So after you scan the code and you key in the link, you'll be shown a list of techniques, and I like you to rank them. So out of those techniques. Okay, so there'll be two slides. Okay, in each slide, there will be five techniques of monitoring and evaluating modules. I would like you to rank them from the one that is most frequently used to the one that's least frequently used, okay? Or the one that you plan to use most frequently and the ones that you plan not to use frequently or probably you have never heard about, okay? So again, take out your phone. All right, and I'd like you to scan or go to that website or click on that site and then or go to that link, please. Okay. I'll give you a couple of minutes for this one. So remember, there are two slides. So once you've done with these, we'll move on to the next one. Go ahead, please. Okay, they're coming in. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Survey. Test. Okay. Wow. Great. Uh huh. Okay. Lots of people go on test, survey. Yep. A lot of tests. Yep. Obviously, we love tests. Yes, that's the easiest way to find out. And then, of course, tests, we talk about diagnostic, you know, aptitude, proficiency tests to see whether they are, you know, um, up to scratch. Yes. Okay, to find out. Yep, lots of tests. So sometimes tests can also be experimental as well. You know, you try on this one and you do a test to see where they're at. Okay, so, yep, survey, definitely. Um, projects, okay, projects ranks third, okay, okay, no, reflections catching up, okay, projects catching up, interview season seems to be at the bottom because really, who's got time for that, yeah, mm -hmm. and usually interviews, Sometimes um, the, the whole notion of interviews, um, ladies and gentlemen, like interviews is not necessarily, you know, sitting down, talking to students about what they think, because um, recently in, in, in the world of um, qualitative research, they talk about interview as mobile interviewing, meaning that you're walking together with the students or you're, you, 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 you're talking to your students, you know, when you're heading somewhere and they can share you know, some of your thoughts with you. And that's also how you, you know, you can find out about your module. So mobile interviewing. So you're interviewing as you go. You know, like mobile phone, you have it with you um, wherever, you know, so mobile interview. So interview does not always mean sitting down, chatting and interviewing formally. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. So I, what I will do, uh, I'll give you, I'll give everyone uh, one more minute, one minute um, to vote, and then it will stop, and then we move on to to the next one. Okay. So these are the five very common ones that I've seen. Mm -hmm. Don't we all love tests? Yes, that's the quickest. Yes, we do survey. Okay, we've got um, about 15 seconds for people to key in their votes. Okay, five seconds, four, three, two, one, stop. Okay, all right. So from here we can see, of course, tests have a lot and uh, test the first one and then you have survey projects. Yes, you get students to do something and then you see um, the evaluation and progress sometimes, projects sometimes it's, it's progress, it's ongoing, but also you can also see it at the end as well to see whether, you know, you've done, 
you, you've been sensible. Um, yep, interviews, of course, who've, who's got time for that? Okay, let, let's move on to the next one. So the next uh, techniques. Okay. All right. Oh, what is going on? Hmm. Okay. Okay, portfolios. Yep. Peer observations. Yep. Social media, document analysis. Yep, fill notes. Okay, it's still sitting there. All right, so portfolio seems to be, mm -hmm, social media is catching up. The portfolios is you know, something that's also um, ongoing, longitudinal, uh, social media. Now, I think I probably want to clarify, you know, uh, each and every one of them. So social media, you look at the Facebook posting, basically, or you look at students' Twitter. Um, peer observation, you get your colleagues to come and see, uh, observe the way you teach to see if you are sort of aligning yourself with the, with the values um, or with the department's visions and missions. Document analysis. Mm, I'm actually quite surprised. Document analysis. Uh, this is when you do what we call content analysis. So you look at the content, you look at students' assignments, you look at, um, oh, now it's going up. Uh, document, uh, yeah. So you look at students' assignments, you look at students' presentation, uh, not, not, not presentation, but most like uh, written, written documents. Okay. Field notes, yep. So we take we take notes. I don't know. Uh, we we go out there. We look at, for example, if you're from the Faculty of Education, uh, you go out there and you take notes of their performance to see how much impact you have made on their pedagogical skills or teaching skills. So that's if you're from the 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 education department or teaching department. Okay. Great. Now that I've explained, document analysis seems to be the second one. Okay. Second most um, frequently used. Because really, document analysis, it doesn't take a lot of time. And you do it as you go. And that's what I did. Um, so for, for, for my uh, publication that I just showed you earlier, I just looked at everything, look at what students have written, and came up with, you know, uh, with a paper. So this is something that maybe you can, you guys can... Uh, can do. Okay, so I'll give everybody uh, one more minute, okay, so that we can move on. Okay, a few more seconds. Hmm. Yeah. Four, three, two, one. Okay, now voting is closed. Great, that's the overall results. Okay, so obviously um, portfolios. I'm, you know, very glad to see this because 
um, here in Singapore, portfolios is still catching up. It's not popularly used um, in Australia. Only certain departments, only certain faculties would use portfolios, especially in the teaching department. Yes, we use lots of portfolios because the way they, well, I think that really depends on the, uh, is the institutions as well, because those that see teaching as, um, as, a, as a progress or as a process, they would get students to do portfolios. And yeah, okay, document analysis and peer observations, social media. Okay, field notes, yeah, again, that takes up a lot of time. So some people may not um, want to um, invest their time in it. Okay, great. So let's uh, go back to my slides. Okay, so those are the techniques that you have seen. Okay, there are 10 of them, and I'm pretty sure that there are more. Okay, so interview, survey, test projects. Perhaps if I can, I mean, based on uh, research findings, a lot of teachers, uh, lecturers, and educational institutions, they go for survey and test because they are the easiest ones and the quickest, uh, most efficient techniques to evaluate your modules your your instructional materials you want to be and also it can reach you know large audience whereas interviews once again who's got time for that um only people like myself i'm i i love you know chatting with my students and then that's where i get in-depth data um so really the, the the ones that i use a lot is test and interview and documents analysis the and field notes of course because these are the ones that generate um lots and lots of findings and insights into you know um into your modules so but really i think that oh the, the, there's another one that i have not included um in here is this is this is this is done by one of the scholars in in the field of language education um he he also argued that graffiti you probably you'll probably be laughing there, and I wish I can see you. I can see you laughing. You know, graffiti and scribbles on the table, the the, the little notes that students have written or, or they write about the modules that are about your teaching. He actually he he went around and collected those. He took pictures of those, and he argued that and and he produced a wonderful um, um paper out of this and. And he argued that this is actually one, another technique to monitor and evaluate your learning modules and to evaluate your teaching because graffiti scribbles on the table, they are honest. There's no filter there. You know, they write what they think about your modules. Sometimes with survey and test, well, sometimes they just can't be bothered and they want to finish it. Okay, interviews because you're there, so they kind of sort of threaten. They don't know what to do, so they may say things that one that may please you. You know, they may say, "Oh, your learning module is wonderful. It's brilliant." You know, but don't know. Um, of course, honesty and telling the truth is 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 um, one thing that you you hope that they they they, they will do. Uh, document analysis again, if I if I um, evaluate or analyze their, their written assignments, hey, you know, they may say things that they want, that, that you want to hear so that they get a good grade, you know? So how do you know that they have achieved it? How do you know that they've learned something? How do you know um, what they think honestly? So that's why this scholar looked at the graffitis, if there are, of course, I'm not saying that, you know, students, um, you know, everywhere they would write things on the table, but he found out that graffitis, scribbles, the notes that they pass around, if you can catch them, and if they are relevant to your modules, of course, um, it's an honest opinion about something. There's no filter there. There's no power imbalance because they're done in secret. Sometimes also social media as well. That's another where block spot, you know, because in technology, we, I actually ask my students to do this. So every time using Padlet, the one that the, the platform that you used um, earlier in the, in the first activity. So as I teach, I get them to write what they think about, you know, whatever that I was teaching 
um, in that in that platform. And because it can be anonymous, they are very honest. They can come up with names, you know, um, apples and beer and whatever, you know, crazy horse, you know, and you don't know who they are and they're very honest. And that will tell you um, your performance, your quality of your instructional materials. So really, there are so many techniques, so many, um, some people call it research instruments or instruments. But at the end of the day, which one that suits you, it depends on your purpose. We don't just simply measure, measure, measure. We also want to describe what is going on so that we can learn about the effectiveness of our modules. Sometimes we need that rich and thick description or descriptions of um, whatever that is happening around us so that we can interpret, so that we can see the quality, the strength, the weaknesses of our learning modules, okay? So these are some of the, uh, the techniques. Now, the last thing that I wanted to talk about is issues in monitoring and evaluation. There are lots of issues. I'll tell you, I have been through this and it's not a pleasant um, experience. It's, it's, it's great because I've learned something out of it and that's why I can give a talk about this. Monitoring and evaluating learning modules, they are not always a smooth process. Not always. You know, throughout the process, you are likely to encounter issues that lead to the emergence of, I call it STD. So not the disease that you're probably thinking about, not that. Um, you're likely to encounter conflicts, issues, okay? I'm not being skeptical, I'm just being realistic, okay? Because monitoring, evaluating modules, they are promoting changes. They are evaluating something so that changes are prompted. So what are these STD? They are struggles, they are tension, they are dilemmas. So filled with struggles, filled with tension, okay? Not the STD disease that you guys are thinking about, okay? All right? So there are lots of struggles because you are promoting changes. You are evaluating. Who likes to be evaluated? Okay? So lots of struggles, lots of tensions, lots of dilemmas. Should I do this? Should I do that? What if, you know, because sometimes when you when you design something, you have to make sure that your dean, the, the, the dean of the faculty is happy with you or, or, or the head of department is happy with your work. So, but, but, but then you know your students well, but also you are sort of in between, okay? Been through that, been there, done that, hate it, but um, also learned something out of it. So what are the issues that, of course, that have led to the emergence of these STD, okay? Support from the top level management. Is there any support for you to monitor and evaluate your module? To get a support is not easy because the moment you say, I need to evaluate my module, that means I need to change it later on. Uh -uh. Um, usually they go, yeah, we'll think about it, okay? So, and sometimes do they see the need to evaluate, for, for you to evaluate and monitor your module, okay? So trust me, when I was asked to revamp that BA program in Australia, it was not um, a, a smooth process because the top level management said, why? It was okay before, but why do you want to do it? And why do you want to scrape the eight modules and then replace with entirely new ones? Why do you need to do? So it's a lot of why and why and why. Any resources available? So you want to use softwares, the latest technology to evaluate your modules. You want to see if you can see, you know, like if you, if you use these um, technology, uh, you want to see improvement in your students' learning. You know, are there facilities? Um, are there, you know, what if the facilities are limited? Okay, or that software to, to, to monitor your students' learning is not available. But then you get this pressure from, um, well, either from your department or from your university that, hey, we are living in the 21st century, has to be technology enabled. But then there is no technology, there are no facilities, what to do. So dilemma, 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 tension, struggles. This is one thing that I, 
probably many of us encounter, or I have been, you know, I encounter this a lot. There's a mismatch between your module and realities. What you teach is not um, relevant to the realities or what you have been asked to teach. It's not uh, matching with the, the realities. So then, or sometimes it's not required by the organizational landscape. So you get these dilemmas. Um, and lucky last, as I said, when you evaluate modules, you are asking for change. You want changes, yeah? And of course, as I said, module, people, colleagues, we are within an ecosystem. We don't, uh, we don't have the module independently from, you know, existing independently from these people. We are, it's, it, we are in this together. In order to evaluate, in order to monitor module, you're asking for a change, but are people open to change? Are they ready to change? How ready are they to face changes? They are difficult colleagues. They are difficult, you know, I don't want to say your colleagues are difficult, but I certainly had a very difficult colleagues back then. Um, didn't want to change. And sometimes colleagues are superiors who do not wish to monitor or, or evaluate the module. Been through that. It's As I said, it's not a smooth process. Okay, so again, frustrated, frustrated, frustrated. I outpour my frustration, turning this frustration in a scholarly manner. So I write a book, entirely a, a book about it. I even did a PhD on it just to express my frustrations. Okay, and this is a true story because uh, th that, that particular book is, my entire journey for, um, I think for, for about eight years, monitoring and evaluating a module within a very difficult context, okay? And the reason why I, of course, I'm, I'm not, you know, saying that you need, when you get frustrated, you go and write a book, no. I was actually quite surprised when I get this out and published in a scholarly manner, I was quite surprised that I was not alone. You get hurt, you'll be surprised that you are not the only one sharing this concern. And you'll find your own group, you'll find these people, and sometimes you even get together either through conferences or, or consortium like this, you get together and you make changes and you, 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 you throw you know, ideas of how you can improve um, learning, okay? So I just wanted to, um, there are a few more slides to go, a few more as in like two to three more to go, uh, but I just wanted to end with a, with a, with a really, uh, a very important message. Um, I don't want to talk, talk about the whole sense of agency, okay? Monitoring, evaluation, they are all about proposing, initiating, making, justifying changes. You're making changes. You want to see changes. Good change, not a bad one. You want to improve students' learning. But educators, especially university educators, because we are you know, scholars, you need to have a sense of agency. And what do I mean by that? Agency means the ability and confidence to make your own decisions unapologetically, but for the betterment of the society, and most importantly, our students' learning. So we are educators, we educators, we are agents of social change, okay? So language educators, we need to take, uh, sorry, not language educators, but educators in general, we need to take active, agentive role in evaluating our professional practices. And I'll tell you, this is not, you, you cannot, honestly, monitoring and evaluation, it's not something that you can escape. Even when I'm talking to you right now, I am monitoring and evaluating my performance. I'm asking myself, am I doing a good job? Oh my God, because I don't hear any of you. I can't see any of you. I don't even know if I'm talking to people. So that's why I don't know. And this is what I'm monitoring and evaluating, okay? You cannot escape it. After you finish a class, after you finish a module, you, when you get home, you think, yeah, did I say the right thing? Mm, maybe I should have done this, I should have done that. And you improve, okay? Can't get rid of it. 
And you probably notice throughout my talk, I keep on saying, I get frustrated. I, pr I do research. I get frustrated. I write research uh, because I, I, I was asked to, to talk about this, to share tips um, to um, everyone here. You don't have to have a, a, a big project. You can start small especially in the, in, the, in the monitoring and evaluation um, inquiry. People often think that research is a, it's a big project. It involves lots of people, use all these complicated research instruments and, 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 and methodologies and whatnot. Yes, if you can afford the time, yeah, go ahead. And I mean, no problem. And, but one, one thing that I want, want to show you, uh, what you may have seen, is that monitoring and evaluating module, it comes in different sizes, okay? You can start small, and that's a tip for you. You can collect the data whilst you are teaching. You look, you observe, you know, what, what, how your students feel, and you look at their papers, and you evaluate, and you look at your content and see, and then you go out there and see what's required in the reality. Done. That's a research project for you. Okay? So you can start small. Monitoring and evaluation, if you want to get it out there, you can always start small. Uh, I mean, this is just very recent ones that I just look at the textbooks. That's it. Look at the content. This is a very simple um uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, research that I've conducted is look at the textbook. Are they preparing students for reality? Yes, no, why, how, done. That's a, a writing um, project for you, really. Okay, so as I said, it's something that that you can never escape. Okay, whether you like it or not, it's there. Okay, so I hope that this talk and of course, other talks that you have attended have sort of prompted you to um, design modules that are accountable and that work well within your educational ecosystem. Of course, I cannot promise you they won't be STD. They will be STD. Okay, but it's just that you have to find ways um, to deal with it. I mean, of course, my, my, my defense mechanism is or my way of dealing with it is I write about it. And then I get to hear from, you know, uh, people from different um, parts of the world. Oh, so, so before moving on to the Q&A session, um, once again, I like to, I like to get you to, to take you back to the, um, the questions that I posed at the very beginning, you know, which is again, to evaluate what you have learned. So have you achieved what you wanted to achieve today? you know, or from this talk or at this consortium? And if not, what else do you think you could have done differently or could have been done differently? I could have done differently because as I said, this is reflexive. You know, I'm sharing my experiences and I'm hoping that you share your experiences as well. You know, what do you think that we could have done in, uh, differently so that we improve each other's learning, okay? And what's your next plan? Let's say that you your purpose hasn't been or you haven't achieved what you wanted to achieve. So what's your next plan? Okay, so this is when you monitor, okay, or you evaluate your next step. Thank you very much, or maraming salamat po. And any questions? All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Roby Marlina for the very comprehensive discussion, very informative and very insightful discussion. Thank you. And I know our participants have learned a lot and I know I there's hope. still also questions. <laughs> I, I'm pretty <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in my part, I really like the word accountability. So yep. when we talk about monitoring and evaluating, mm -hmm. so I like the word accountability <laughs> and the STD, <laughs> the struggles, the tension. And then, so that's really the reality you know, when we talk about monitoring and evaluating. Yeah. So producing instructional materials is not enough. You know? That's right. If we want to go into monitoring and evaluating, Mm. So that's really part of the cycle. Yes. Okay. Exactly, so exactly. May I now? Okay, Dr. Merlina is now uh, accepting questions. So we will be sourcing out questions from the three platforms. 
uh, first we'll have first from the chat uh, Zoom chat room. Okay. Uh, questions will be popping out, hopefully. <laughs> Please hopefully. have your questions coming. <laughs> so this is a sort of monitoring evaluation. This is monitoring well. <laughs> and evaluation, exactly. So we are monitoring and I'm also monitoring <laughs> my performance and evaluating my own performance. <laughs> you know. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Okay. So any question? Okay. So if you want to, for those who are on board, you may raise your hand for you to be recognized. Or right, you may click the the button. Where is it? Okay. So there's there they might just there might be thinking first with their That's question, okay. That's okay. You, uh, there are you a lot need of to think. comments we see. Okay. Just take your time. <laughs> okay, so I've uh, I've read some comments here. A lot of compliments regarding regarding your talk. Thank you. Very nice talk. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Salamat po. <laughs> <laughs> then, salamat po. Okay, from our participants out there, any question? Any questions? Would appreciate your questions. The silence means... Silence <laughs> is silence golden. Means everything is understood. Uh, wow, really? <laughs> <laughs> There's no such thing as perfect just talk. Like the, <laughs> there are lots of... <laughs> <laughs> it's like the scribble and graffiti that you have mentioned earlier. Uh-huh. Uh, they, they, they may appear like they're silent, but you can see a lot of, <laughs> you know, uh, emotion. So you're probably... <laughs> unhidden messages. And you can you can certainly okay, write it in no the No question. Thank you very much. Oh wow, really? So I have here from Christina Istuliano from our one of our participants. According to her, no question. Thank you very much. Oh, I wow. like thank you. the interactive manner of the webinar. Excellent. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comprehensible and comprehensive lecture. Oh wow! Thank from you Lucille so Duriado much. From NWSSU. But okay. I have to say, I, I'm very grateful for your participations, uh, especially in the the Mentimeter and the comments. They just kept popping up. So very, very grateful. That, that's something that we are really enjoying. The, the the interaction through our cell phones. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So since questions are not coming, I, I'll just read the comments here. We have here from Bipso from Biliran Province State University. I would like to commend Dr. Marlina for his presentation. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Salamat Paul. <laughs> <laughs> So no questions at all. <laughs> okay, I hope we we have questions from our FB Live and YouTube viewers. Okay. So I've heard there is one. Oh wow, that's great. Okay, the question is. So this is from FB Live. Yep. Sirobi. Yep. Where is it? Wait. Oh, there is one question though on our group chat here. From there uh, is. yeah, there is from Sir okay, Gabino Petilos. So how do we uh, okay, evaluate? How do yeah. we evaluate evaluate if the module we prepared is appropriate for our intended users. Yep. Okay, so to answer that question, um, so there are there are actually two ways. So one is we call needs analysis. So you need to come up with a list of questions to see uh, if they are if if your module really meets, you know, their needs. 
So we call it needs analysis. So whether or not they can use it in their context, whether they, they find it useful. And sometimes you can do this at the beginning or at the end. So this is what we call the pre-assessment um, and the post-assessment to see if they are appropriate. So for example, um, if your intended users, um, if they're teachers, for example, of course I need to find out, you know, um, what what they need what they need to learn do they need to learn about assessment or content or pedagogy or so a list of questions need to be prepared to see and also th th this is why sometimes i don't like the the whole notion of pre and post as well i, I know that I'm, I'm contradicting myself because I, i'm thinking i'm thinking back to my own experience i do it as i go i have question a list of questions with me all the time to see if it is appropriate. So it's ongoing, it's live, you know, and then looking and finding out students' needs, finding out the users' needs, finding out what they want to, 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 to learn, okay? So it's, um, yeah, as I said, needs analysis is the key factor there, yeah. Okay. Now we have here a question uh, sourced out from the from our viewers from YouTube Live yep. from Mr. Ariel Bilunzaga. Yep. His question is: What do we need to look for if we evaluate our module itself? What do you need to look for when you evaluate your module yourself? Okay, yes. so there are a couple of things um, as I said. So. Again, it, it depends on you. So when you look at your modules, of course you look at your content and you look at your assessment tasks, your rubrics, your um, you know, uh, uh, grading scale. You know, these are the, the, the main, I'm not sure about the Philippines context, but in, in Australia, these are the main things that you need to have in your modules, the topics, the sequence of the topics, the assessment tasks, uh, the grading scale and the rubrics. But then if you just look at that, it's not enough. You also need to look at these in the light of your users. As uh, I think Sir Gabino Petilos asked me earlier, how do we know that they are appropriate? So when you look at the modules, these are the specific things that you look at. Appropriate in what sense? Whether they are relevant to your, to your uh, users' needs, whether they are relevant to the context. So that the, 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 the little circles that I that I that I showed you, the, the diagram that I showed you, how your module is a is a part of ecosystem. Okay. So you look at the content, the pedagogy, and the assessment in the light of um, the values and the the reality. Because from my experience, when the modules are not in line with the, the, the reality, with the recent yes. paradigm of teaching and learning, that's where um, the, the, the alert comes in because the universities will start questioning why your modules are not um, up to date, why your modules are not relevant to the students' needs, for example. So... Yeah, so I mean, the, my, my experience of that industrial um, element in the module, if it's not there, then, you know, you are at risk. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Another question from our YouTube viewers. Yep. What is the accepted frequency of conducting evaluation of a module? <laughs> okay. <laughs> now... As I said, yes, frequency, like how often, yeah? For me, it's very difficult to put a number there because when you ask for frequency, is, is it a week? Is it a weekly thing? Is it a monthly thing? Is it a semester thing or a yearly thing or annually? You know, for me, evaluation and monitoring, it, they take place anytime, anywhere. It's a continuous thing it's ongoing how frequent depends on um your situation your context 
for example, um, uh, where I was before in, in, in Australia, at the end of every semester, we need to, uh, one semester is three months. At the end of every semester, I have to report to um, the faculty members as well as to uh, my colleagues, our performance. And then that performance gets sent to it. So it's, it's, a, it's a semester thing. Whereas over here, here in Singapore, um, in my institution in particular, it's at the end of every course. And one course is usually about three to four weeks. So it's, it's a continuous thing. It's a, and even, uh, I don't yes. know if I'm allowed to say this, um, uh, I just had my work review, my annual work review, and one of the key performance indicators is do I revamp my materials? That's a key performance indicator. <laughs> if I don't revamp, I get yeah. into trouble. So you see, it's, it's a job requirement um, in this particular context. Sorry, boss, I'm not talking bad about you, but I'm just saying it's a great thing. Yeah, <laughs> if he's listening. <laughs> so how frequent? So whether you like it or not. Yeah, whether you like it or not, it's there. You do it. You it's, have to do it. You have to do it. It's, it's a part of you. <laughs> I mean, even when you're teaching, even now when I'm talking, I'm monitoring too. <laughs> you know, so you can't escape. You can't escape. It's, it's, it's in you as a teacher. I remember that my, um, my supervisor, when I was a beginning teacher, um, she said, teachers make decisions. Teacher, you know, keep monitoring themselves every second, every minute. So we are the best decision makers in the world, apparently, because we monitor how we yes. do things, you know, our decisions and the impact in particular on our students. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? And another question from YouTube as well. The yep. same from YouTube viewer. <laughs> Based on your experience, sir, how do you monitor classroom performance in an online setting? Classroom performance online setting. Okay, so um, we are now in that mode at the moment and we're trying out different things. Um, one thing is we do checklist. So we have a checklist. So students get sent this checklist so that they will need to, and this checklist needs to be updated every week to make sure and to see, and they, they, they well, when they, when we give out one assessment task, then the students will need to tell you after they've completed it, they need to tell you, okay, um, this task, I have done this, I've done this, I've done this, I haven't done this, why? And this yes. is back and forth, okay? That's one um, way. The second one is that platform that I did with you um, at the beginning of my talk, it's called Padlet, P-A-D-L-E-T. Um, that one, it's it's for students to share, you know, their thoughts there, and it's it's ongoing, and they can use it on the phone. You can see how simple it is, and all you need to do, you just have a link, and they can just type, and you can access to it anywhere. And to be honest with you, um, it's really great because as I was talking earlier, I received messages from Padlet saying that these are what people have said. So it's ongoing. So I can see the progress mm -hmm. you know, as you go. So these are the, they're, honestly, there are lots and lots of softwares out there. Um, but the one that I prefer is, of course, Padlet because it's free and it's anonymous and, you know, and it's live. Yeah. So okay. that is one, and checklist is another one. Yeah. So I. Yep. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Yeah. They're still. <laughs> Great. Bring it on. <laughs> so they're really into with your topic. They're really engaged with your topic. Oh, thank okay. you. From our YouTube you, you as well. <laughs> Does it necessary to have many pages in making module per topics? Per topics. Uh, what? What? Okay. Um, if I understand it correctly, so do you need to have a lot of? Okay. Can Can you rephrase? Can you say the question again? Can you read out the question again? Okay. 
Uh, does it necessary uh -huh. to have many pages in making module per topics? Oh, okay. So I think uh, she's referring to the pages. Number of pages. Honestly, um, okay. Yeah. The <laughs> it's really difficult to quantify uh, because what matters is quality, of course. Uh, yes. If you can write a clear, succinct um, module outline, yeah, it's very clear as to what the aims are, what the topics are, and what the assessment tasks are, what the assessment rubrics are. If you have those, the the I call it the nitty gritty, the nuts and bolts of your module written in three or four pages, um, that will do actually, yeah. Okay, so what matters is quality, to be perfectly honest with you, because I've seen a module outline, um, uh, because I was, I was, I was reviewing this, this um, module outlines from a university, can't remember where it was, I think it was in, it was in, yeah, it was in one of the ones in Australia. Uh, there, there were 20 pages. And it's all policies, 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 policies. Now, this is this is not relevant, okay? And the assessment is only one sentence. So please go and write this. Please and search that. No, that is not helpful. So the one that is um, effective, so to speak, is the one that um, that use. I don't know because I'm a I'm a linguist with the active verb. So that means students need to know what they need to do. So I write, yes. I prepare, I, you know, um, I, I discuss, you know, for five minutes, for example, something like that. So something very clear, um, something that they do rather than, um, you know, uh, think about, you know, well, how, how, how do we see that? So um, verbs that are observable and that you can see that they're actually doing it and writing it. So it has to be. Um, very clear and succinct. Mm. Okay. More questions? No, I have here a question from our Facebook Live viewer. Okay. Because earlier, it's more it on YouTube. YouTube. Yep. Okay. I find this question interesting. Great. Is the number... <laughs> is the number of failure uh -huh. an indicator of a good module? Okay, <laughs> this is brilliant. Um, I remember, actually, if I can share a quote with you, um, let me see if I can, because I, I, want, I want to get this right. And I think this is, this is, this is a, a, a really great quote um, that I've encountered. I think it says something about, it's not about failure, but, but, but it's more about, ah, you want to know the difference between a master and a student? Uh, do, do you want to know the difference between a master and a beginner? So what is the difference between a master and a beginner? The difference is the master has failed more times than the beginner has even tried. So yes. that's the answer for you. So I don't see failures um, as indicators that it's a bad modules. Actually, I have created modules that th th there are always loopholes. There are always areas that don't work. There are always content that, and because as I said, knowledge is dynamic. Students are dynamic. They bring rich histories and every semester is colorful to be perfectly honest with you. So sometimes there are some topics that don't work. Great, you change. And that's how we um, promote learning, you know, and that's how we become a master because we failed many times in order for us to, um, to become a, 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 a good, um, you know, a, a master or an expert in the field. And once again, if I can share another story, this is from my father. It's an analogy. And he said, do you know how they process a diamond? Yeah, a diamond came from raw materials that just look disgusting. But you have to process it yes. many times, many times, many times, many times. And then it will become diamond and it's worth gazillion dollars yeah, or pesos. Yeah. I hope okay. that answers the questions. <laughs> so that's the role of failures in our lives. 
<laughs> yes, yes. There's no such thing as failures. I, I, I really want to emphasize this. No such thing as failure because every module, every teaching material has its own strength and also has its yes. areas that need improvement. So if you if you have that um, that 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 perspective of looking at things, I think that um, you will begin. You know, you you'll have a great modules. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, mm. uh, one last question. Yep. Who is an effective and efficient evaluator of modules? Who is it? Okay. Who is an effective uh -huh. and efficient <laughs> evaluator of modules? Uh, honestly, I love these questions. This is this is great. I have been uh, asked this uh, question many times. My answer is, it's always both the teacher and the student, because. Okay. The students, well, I'm sorry, it's not necessarily, um, you know, uh, of course, the dean has the experience and the, the, the views and everything. The university, certainly, they, they have their own views. But what matters is the recipients and then the one who impart the knowledge. How do you guys work together? Because... They, the only person, I mean, I mean, of course, whether that module works, it's the students who can tell you, it's how you respond to that. It's a collaboration, it's a dialogical nature of teacher and students that make it work. There is no evaluator or best evaluator, as in singular, best evaluators are actually these two people yeah working together on co-constructing your module it's not just one person doing it if the teacher is the one it's impossible because your experience may not match the life of the student so it needs to be both ways so um i just wanted to emphasize okay. on that that collaborative nature that, that that's dialogics uh dialogic teaching really um in, in education and monitoring yeah Okay, so yep. in as much as we would like to accommodate all the questions, <laughs> but since we are running short of time, we still have our closing program. So I'm so grateful, Dr. Marlina, for your Thank time, you. for your expertise. You. Yep. Okay, so with that note, to award the Certificate of Appreciation to our resource speaker, Thank they you. give you to our CHED Region 8 Director, Dr. George Colorado. Sir? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Excuse me, sir. Dr. Colorado. Sir. Unmute your mic, please, sir. Dr. Colorado. Yeah, unmute. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Do you need the certificate of recognition? Thank you. This for his invaluable service as resource speaker during the learning and hard education institutions webinar series on June 19, 2020. Given this 19th day of June in the year of our Lord 2020, signed. Jude Duarte, President of LSU, Chair of the President Committee, signed Norberto Olaguer, President of the of the Content Development Committee, signed Bill Jr., President of BIPSU, the EBHEI's MSP, signed Joseph Colorado. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Colorado. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Dr. Thank Marina. You. Thank you very much. Thank to you, Colby. To all our participants, can we give a virtual <laughs> round of applause to our speaker? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. Stay safe there. Okay. Stay safe, everyone. Take care. All right. Take Thank care. You. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Right. bye. bye, -bye. Okay, so that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Our, our last topic for our series of webinars. So at least uh, this topic is very fitting to end this series of webinars uh, because it tells us that after all we have produced our course modules, it is about fitting for us to get into monitoring and evaluating as well, right? So with that, um, I've seen the, uh, may I, okay, so for now, we will have the webinar evaluation. So you have the link there. So all participants may it be in the Zoom, FB Live and YouTube. Okay, please get the link and then you're given 10 minutes to answer this, to do the evaluation for information for everybody, for you to get their, or for you to receive the certificate of participation, you need to answer the webinar evaluation. And, and of course you have to submit all the webinar session attendance. So that is coming from the content development committee. So 10 minutes for, for the webinar evaluation. Please stay tuned because right after this, we still have our closing program. Let me remind as well that the attendance will be give, or the link for attendance will be given right after the closing program. Again, the attendance, we will have it right after the closing program. Okay, all right, can we proceed to the closing program? So at this point, may I give you now to Dr. Diana Rose Ismero for the closing program.
Good afternoon, Eastern Visayas. Ladies and gentlemen, mabuhay. I believe everybody is up for the closing program of the EVHEI's FLMSC training workshop on course modules production for flexible learning in higher education institutions. Indeed, the webinar has been both undoubtedly awakening and deeply assuring venue that the coming school year is worth bracing ourselves for, because after this, is certainly the inescapable and the inevitable roller coaster ride with a twist of being abreast of what's in and a must in response to the new but definitely better normal in this trying time. Here are some lines worth pondering. They say technology won't replace teachers, but teachers who use technology will probably replace teachers who do not. Do you agree? And this is how Bill Gates affirms us. Technology is a tool in terms of getting the students work together and motivate them. The teacher is the most important. In fact, technology will never replace great teachers. But technology in the hands of great teachers is transformational. Ladies and gentlemen, Eastern Desires, help me welcome the brainchild of the EVHEI's FLMSS Consortium, Chad Commissioner Dr. Aldrin A. Darilag for his message. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon, po. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Aldrin, kumusta? Okay lang po. <laughs> Dr. Victor C. Cañeso, Jr., the Interim Chair of the Eastern Visayas Higher Education Institutions Flexible Learning Management System Consortium, and at the same time, the President of Beliran Province State University, Dr. Dominador Aguirre, the President of Eastern Visayas State University and the President of PASOK 8, Dr. Jude Duarte, the Chair of the Content Development Committee and the President of Leyte Normal University, Dr. Norberto C. Olavides, the Co-Chair of the Content Development Committee and President of Palompon Institute of Technology. All the Presidents present here, Dr. Marilyn Cardoso, uh, Dr. Pros Ivy Yepes, and other presidents of the state universities and colleges of Region 8, Dr. George Colorado, the regional director of CHED Regional Office 8, and of course, our participants who have braced the past few days of this training workshop, a pleasant and meaningful afternoon to all of you. Just a few days ago, I was given the humble on honor to speak at the opening of this series of training workshops on content development by the Eastern Visayas Consortium. And thus, it is also with gratitude that I am now able to grace its closing ceremony as well. To that, let me express once again my sincerest thanks to the 10 state universities and colleges that make up this consortium for their unrelenting drive of making sure that the transition towards the new normal is as successful as we can make it to be. Now to the faculty members that have gone through the days where they listened with deep intent and focus to the resource persons invited, please acknowledge your achievement and realize the good work you have accomplished. Despite the challenges that you faced amidst this pandemic, you stood your ground. Through your firm conviction to pursue learning, even if it is under this unfamiliar modality, is indeed a vivid proof of your commitment to the enshrined principles we vowed to uphold as educators and scholars of the 21st century. As such, please accept my warmest appreciations to all of you. 
Before I conclude, let me impart to all of you some words of encouragement that we can all bring to our students as well as we prepare for the upcoming academic year. I hope that these quotes may help us further as we continue to reflect on the happenings around our lives and our careers as teachers while this COVID-19 threat remains. First, an insightful quote from the renowned First Lady of, of the United States of America, Ms. Abigail Adams, who said that, and I quote, learning is not attained by chance, it must be sought for with ardor and attended with, with diligence. The very reason why we are all gathered at this very moment is to commemorate your achievement in completing this webinar series. All of you, I should say, have the guts, the will, and the decisiveness to not just merely pursue it, but rather complete the entirety. Maybe for a few, they realize how daunting it is to find ways of being connected or juggled through the constraint with time, or even tried in earnest to be ingenious in resolving financial difficulties. Whatever the trials you have faced in this journey, it is simply because you have righteously chosen to treasure and cherish the value of learning. Hence, the question arises from this. What should be our attitude in order for us to never lose the essence and role of learning to our lives? Let me end my message by sharing the wise words of Chinese philosopher and intellectual Confucius, in which he has said, and I quote, to learn as though you would never be able to master it. Hold it as though you would be in fear of losing it. Let this be the impenetrable mantra we all should possess as we journey together towards flexible learning under the new normal paradigm. To the participants of the training workshop on content development of the Region 8 Consortium, once again, my sincerest congratulations. God bless you all and mabuhay po kayong lahat. Thank you, Dr. Derilag. Three selected participants will now give their impressions on the five-day training workshop. To start, we have Professor Rex V. Palompon from Eastern Visaya State University. Professor Rex Palompon from Eastern yes, Visayas State University. Yes, ma'am. I'm here. Good afternoon, po. My warm greetings to our Shed Commissioner, Dr. Alden A. Darilag, our Shed Regional Office 8 Regional Director, Dr. George M. Colorado, the Interim Chair for Eastern Visayas Higher Education Institution Flexible Learning Management System Consortium, and at the same time, the president of Biliran Province State University, Dr. Victor Sikanyesa Jr., the chair of the Content Development Committee, and at the same time, the president of Lady Normal University, Dr. Jude A. Duarte, the co-chair of the Content Development Committee, and at the same time, the president of Palompon Institute of Technology, Dr. Norberto C. Olavides. Our expert resource persons are here equally respected university presidents and focal persons who are here present today, esteemed colleagues in the academe from the different state universities and colleges, to one and all a pleasant afternoon. William Haley said, and I quote, education would be much more effective if its purpose was to ensure that by the time they leave school, every boy and girl should know how much they do not know and be imbued with a lifelong desire to know it, end quote. Our webinar series has finally come to an end, but for sure, learnings are never ending. Indeed, 
this training workshop on course module production for flexible learning in higher education institutions brought to us by Eastern Visayas Higher Education Institutions Flexible Learning Management System Consortium has truly become an avenue of knowledge transfer and learning integration in the face of a changing educational delivery modes amidst global health crisis. This series proved that even in the face of great challenge, genuine educators emerged to become better responders to ensuring that learners' education is and will never be taken for granted. Truly, the different sessions by competent and knowledgeable speakers allowed us to gain valuable insights because of their clear, explicit, interesting, interactive, and comprehensible manner of presentations and discussions with concrete examples. And undeniably, this webinar series provided an array of opportunities to relearn, reassess, reevaluate, and re-engage unique capacities and available resources of each participant and university in ensuring that capacity building is seriously grounded on technology integration and scientific application for an inclusive and student-centered learning materials. In its entirety, the webinar series was organized in terms of structure, timeframes, and contents. They all appeared informative and useful, refreshing and challenging, but inspiring at the same time. And so, for and in behalf of our university president, Dr. Dominador Oaguirre Jr., and our focal person, the vice president for academic affairs, Dr. Dennis De Paz, thank you big time for the, to the consortium and its working committees for the success of this webinar series. Spearheading this series or webinar is not easy, but with your unrelentless commitment and support, everything ended beyond our expectation. May you continue to push for more training opportunities as we live in this new normal caused by COVID-19. It is our fervent hope that you will continue to help us, not just during trainings, but every time that we feel that we need you and every time you feel that there is a need for us to be helped by you. And to my co-participants, thank you for your usual cooperation and participation in making this webinar a big success. Truly, the journey together for these undertakings begins. To one and all, mabuhay, and may God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Palomban of Eastern Visaya State University. Next is Dr. Antonia D. Mendoza from the Palompon Institute of Technology. Dr. Mendoza from the Palompon yes. Institute of Technology. Um, I believe most of us are familiar with the saying that says, if you love your work, you won't have to work the day of your life. Such has been passionately manifested by everyone who has been with us in, the, in this journey. The journey on the training workshop of course modules production for a flexible learning. With us were the organizer, the participants, and of course the esteemed speakers. For the very supportive supportive chair Commissioner Dr. Aldrin A. Dadilag and the equally supportive Shadow A. Director Dr. George M. Colorado. To our dynamics of presidents here in Region 8, my fellow workers in the academy, a pleasant afternoon to all of us. On behalf of my colleagues of the Palompon Institute of Technology, I commend the Eastern Vistayas HEI Consortium for the professional approach of facing this health crisis with a true spirit of sharing and resiliency. Truly, the insightful journey was both a great learning and a practical experience to all of us. Indeed, it did not only expand our understanding of what flexible learning is, 
but it also refreshed our previously learned concepts on the relevant pedagogies and approaches within the context of flexible learning. All this gave us so much courage, hope, joy, and steadfast faith that life goes on in spite of adversities and that our commitment as speakers will not be faltered by the COVID-19 pandemic. It was indeed amazing to realize the process itself of connecting and imparting that was made unbelievably possible even if we are miles apart. The speakers created a strong rapport with a virtual setup. Online workshops and activities were perfect practical examples of how to manage and apply flexible learning. True enough, their expertise is a reflection of the unquestionable dedication to their calling as teacher. Their mastery and competency in respective specialization were indeed extensive, inspiring, and unbending. Another exceptional effort was how eager everyone was to meet virtually and how attentive each one in, in exchanging knowledge and experiences, joining from the respective workstation or even from home. It was simply a deep sense of generosity and commitment beyond borders. With the webinars we have had, a major shift from our usual dynamics of gathering as educators may have been compulsory, but in many ways, it was so symbolic of what we hope to reclaim, rediscover, and recreate in the coming school year in the face of this trying time. As a result, a strengthened bond among the members of the consortium is born. Kudos to all. With this, let us fertilize our lands well that the seeds will have the chance to grow. God bless us all, and may our dreams come true. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mendoza from the Palongpan Institute of Technology. Finally, we have Dr. Sherry Ann C. Labid from the Summer State University. My afternoon greetings to the CHED Commissioner, Dr. Aldrin A. Darilag, the CHED Regional Director, Dr. George M. Colorado, my University President, Dr. Marilyn D. Cardoso, other presidents of the different SUCs of the region, my fellow workers in the government, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. When Dr. Makalina called me yesterday, requesting me to give an impression I hesitated for a while because I may sound like magbubuhat ng sariling bangko, considering that I am one of the members of the Content Development Committee of the Consortium. However, being part of it may provide you a different perspective of the process the committee has undergone through. This five-day activity prepared us faculty to do one of the greatest challenges of our profession, and that is facilitating flexible learning in this new normal. And now this is it, we've made it. We are able to finish our training with smiles in our faces. But before we will part ways, please allow me to share some of my impressions. First, I would like to say the speakers of the training were knowledgeable and, com and competent in the topic they were assigned to. They were able to deliver the goods excellently to the participants. I thought all the while that the activities were gonna be boring and dull, considering that there will be a limited interactions between the speaker and the participants. But that was, that wasn't true. Oh, I remember the talk of Dr. Balagdas in her initial activity. Dr. Adina, Dr. Makalde, 
and Dr. Marlena and the rest of the speakers' activities were very interactive and very substantial. With brilliant speakers, I just couldn't find reasons to leave the room and miss an event. Second, the participants were very cooperative and interactive. They particip participated in the different activities provided by the speakers. Questions were raised from the YouTube, Facebook, and Zoom participants. Pero parang kulang ata ang nagtanong ngayong hapon kay Dr. Marlina. Third, the training workshop as a whole was well organized in terms of structure, time frames, and contents. From the start to the end, it went smoothly. As a member of the Content Development Committee, I would like to tell you it did not come out with an overnight preparation. Ladies and gentlemen, it took a lot of nerves and brains on the part of the lead institution, Lady Normal University, to craft the activity. Much time was devoted in the deliberation of the topics that were included in the training. If I remember right, we started our meeting last May 11, and it went through almost every week. With Dr. Macalinao, the presiding officer, and Dr. Vincolado, you see, they had a very excellent way of motivating the member institutions to share their ideas for the refinement of the training workshop. And for this, I would like to commend the lead institution, Lady Normal University, headed by the no, no other than the university president, Dr. Jude A. Duarte. Lastly, I am impressed by the cooperation showed by the different suits of Region 8 and the Commission on Higher Education, Region 8, headed by the director, George Colorado. This training has now come to an end, but the learnings are never ending. Added knowledge and the passion for teaching will surely maximize our potentials as educators as we are one of the most important people to shape the minds of our future leaders. To the SUC's presidents, the organizers and facilitators of this five-day training workshop, thank you so much. And to my co-participants, thank you so much for your cooperation in making this training a success. To everyone, congratulations for a job well done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Professor Palompon, Dr. Mendoza, and Dr. Labid. Your impressions were indeed heartwarming and encouraging. That goes to say that the consortium has to make, in fact, even more engagements like this in the future. So that if I were to get the gist of Dr. Darilak's opening message, and exactly if I were to support those impressions given, the fruit of love is in the works. Where love exists, it works. Great things, right? Now comes the awarding of certificates to participants. Let me inform everybody that only those who have complete attendance during the webinar and who participated in the evaluation earlier will be awarded of the certificate of participation. By the way, let me iterate, the attendance of this afternoon session will be done as soon as the closing program is over. So to do the honor of awarding the certificates of participants, I'll give you back no less than the CHED Commissioner, Dr. Aldrin A. Darilag. Thank you, uh, Dr. Diane. Uh, let me read the certificate of participation. The certificate reads, this certificate of participation is presented to for his or her active participation during the training workshop on course modules production for flexible learning in higher education institutions webinar series on June 11 to 12 and 15 to 19, 2020 given this 19th day of June in the year of our Lord, 2020. 
Signed, Norberto C. Olavides, PhD, President, Palumpon Institute of Technology, Co-Chair, Content Development Committee, Jude A. Duarte, DPA, President, Leyte Normal University, Chair, Content Development Committee, Victor C. Cañeso, Jr., EDD, President of Biliran Province State University, and the Project Leader of Eastern Visayas Consortium, George M. Colorado, PhD, Director, Ched Regional Office 8, and yours truly, Aldrin A. Darilag, PhD, Commissioner, Commission on Higher Education. Congratulations to all our participants and good afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much, Director Darilag. Next are updates from the Content Development Committee. Let me cue the Palakwan Institute of Technology President, Co-Chair of the Content Development Committee, Dr. Norberto C. Olavides. Dr. Aldrin A. Darilag, Commissioner, Commission on Higher Education. Dr. George M. Colorado, Regional Director, Chad Region 8. To all presidents of state colleges and universities in Region 8, as well as the participants from ECUCs. To the support personnel and facilitator from LNU and PIT, good afternoon to all of you. As the webinar series of the Le training workshop on course module production for flexible learning in higher education institution being conducted by the Eastern Messiah's Higher Education Institution Flexible Learning Management System Consortium is about to end. Let me provide you the, content, the updates from the Content and Development Committee as follows. Slide, please. There were 10 successful webinars being conducted by the consortium from June 11, 2020 to June 19, 2020 with seven resource speakers, namely Professor Jerry Arita, Dr. G.C. Barot, Dr. Marilu M. Ubina, Director Aaron Almadro, Dr. Juan Robertino Macaldi, Dr. Marilyn Ubina Balagtas, Dr. Rudy Marlina. Out of the seven resource speakers, uh, out of seven resource speakers, uh, three resource speakers have delivered ten, uh, two topics each and four speakers with one topic each. There, there are 10 issues or state colleges and universities who are involved in the hosting of the webinars. So out of 10, since there are 10, one issue see each is given the opportunity to host the webinar session. Next slide. So the consortium has a Facebook page entitled Eastern Messiah's Higher Education Institution Flexible Learning Management System Consortium Content Development, which was visited by 4,069 people. Next slide. And the Facebook page was reached by 17,603 people. all over the world. It's not only from the local, national, but also international viewers view the Facebook page of the consortium. Next slide. So our Facebook page was visited or viewed by 2,111. Our YouTube, Channel was visited by 6,611. 
uh, on June 11, 20,000 uh, morning session, which was uh, given to us by Dr. or by Professor Jerry Arita. In the afternoon session, our Facebook page was visited or viewed by 1,664 viewers. The YouTube channel was visited by 3,556 viewers. And uh, on June 12, in the morning, the Facebook page was visited or viewed by 1,550 viewers. The YouTube YouTube channel was viewed or seen by 4,235 viewers. Next slide. On June in the 12 in the afternoon, we have uh, 1,684 viewers in the Facebook and in the YouTube channel, 3,569 viewers. While in the gym, there are 42. On June 15, 2020, in the Facebook page was viewed by 2,804 viewers and the YouTube channel was visited by 4,776 viewers. And our Zoom was 76. On June 15 in the afternoon, the Facebook page of the consortium was viewed by 2,245 viewers and the YouTube channel was viewed or seen by 4,449 people. On June 16 in the morning, the Facebook page was viewed by 1,793 viewers, and the YouTube channel was visited by 11,749 visitors. On June 16, 2020, in the afternoon, our Facebook page was viewed by 1,961 viewers, and the YouTube channel was viewed by 5,963 visitors, as well as the Zoom with 63. On June 17, 2020, the Facebook page was viewed by 2,104 viewers, and the YouTube channel was visited by 5,631 viewers, and the Zoom was 61. Uh, all in, uh, there were 1,000 plus accomplished attendance per session from public and public, private higher education institutions. Next slide. So we have on 11, June 11, in the morning session, there were 1,196 participants or attendees who registered. In the afternoon of June 11, there were 1,064 attendees. On June 12, 2020, in the morning, there were 1,131 uh, 1, attendees. On June 12, to 2020 in the afternoon, there were 1,102 attendees. On June 15, to, in the morning session, there were 1,217 attendees. On, in the afternoon of June 5, there were 1,131 attendees. On June 16, 2020, in the morning, there were 1,200 70 attendees. On June 16, 2020, in the afternoon, there were 11, 1,183 attendees. And in the morning of June 17, 1,202 attendees. 
there were 351 enrollees for interinstitutional collaborations. All videos, handouts, and materials are could be downloaded in the Facebook page uh, with this link, with this link. Then what's next? On the part of the individual is you see, uh, on the part of the individual is you see, it might be that uh, the management of the SUC will be uh, giving more premium on the upgrading of internet connectivity, the procurement of equipment and materials needed for the online teaching and the procurement of materials for the production of modules. From June 22 to July 3, our schedule for the production break. So at this point, uh, at this point, uh, the the faculty of the of the institution will be required to produce modules out of the knowledge they learned from the webinar on June on July six to ten. We have to evaluate the module and make necessary revisions if there are any. Next. Uh, let, let me thank, let me thank the members of the consortium for the cooperation, for the success, and for the participation. Thank you very much, Mabuhay Eastern Visayas. Wow, that was amazing, huge number of followers. Kudos again to the Eastern Visayas Higher Education Institution's Flexible Learning Management System Consortium. Ladies and gentlemen, that was PIT President, Dr. Norberto C. Olavides. This time are some updates from the Eastern Visayas Higher Education Institution's Flexible Learning Management System Consortium. This will be done by Dr. Victor C. Cañeza Jr., the President of Biliran Province State University and the Interim Chair of EVHEI's FLMSC. Dr. Cañeza, please. Good afternoon to everyone especially to our ever dynamic head commissioner, Dr. Aldrin A. Darilag, the brainchild of this consortium, our very good regional director, Director George Colorado, the SUC 8 presidents headed by our PASUC 8 president, Dr. Dominador Aguirre of Eastern Visaya State University, our uh, faculty members who are on board on this webinar on course module production for flexible learning. Thank you, Leyte Normal University, for allowing me to give updates on the EVHAI's FLMSC. I am very proud that despite the time of pandemic, we are still united through the Eastern Visayas Higher Education Institutions Flexible Learning Management System Consortium. My warmest congratulations to everyone for this. Early last month, the 10 state universities and colleges in Region 8 conducted a series of meetings and brainstorming through the help of CHED Commissioner, Dr. Aldrin A. Darilag, and CHED Region 8 Director, Dr. George M. Colorado, and some experts from the National Capital Region. The consortium is a region-wide and localized consortium composed of the 10 state universities and colleges, which would eventually be extended to the private higher education institutions in the region. 
The consortium primarily aims to establish a quality learning management system that will be shared and used among public, private, higher education institutions in the region. Specifically, the consortium is composed of five committees, Committee on Content Development, Committee on Training and Capacity Building, Committee on Technology Infrastructure and Support, Committee on Monitoring and Evaluation, and Committee on Policy Development and Agreement, where BIPSU is the interim chairperson and the lead proponent. Through the efforts of our respective officials from the different SOOPs, the consortium is directed to capacitate the faculty members to develop, utilize, and manage flexible online learning modalities and create content modules. Create the content and course modules for different disciplines under the new modalities. Establish and develop online offline infrastructure technology and resources needed for the implementation of online mediated and flexible learning modalities. Consolidate policies and guidelines on the governing responsibilities, obligations of each, each EI and the utilization of generated resources and monitor and assess the implementation of the said learning management system. We are happy to inform everyone that the consortium proposal was already submitted to CHED under the revised and expanded continuing professional education grants under the K-12 program amounting to 82,728,714.70 centavos, which is the aggregate amount of PASUK-8, SUK-8, and CHED counterparts for one year budget allotment, where 25% of which belongs to personal services, 45% to maintenance and other operating expenses, 27% to capital outlay, and 3% to administrative costs. During the past few weeks, the consortium has already conducted impact and needs assessment through a survey for all the member higher education institutions in Eastern Visayas. These surveys include the faculty readiness to deliver flexible modes of learning, survey of the faculty competence on basic computer skills and using learning management system and etc. The consortium through the Southern Leyte State University headed by President Pros IBEPS and Visaya State University through President Edgardo Tolin have been conducting training and capacity building on flexible learning modalities for SOOPs to prepare the faculty members across disciplines to become capable, confident, and responsive to flexible learning and to ensure that the students are well adapted to the flexible learning environment within a network of care. Moreover, I am very glad that our faculty members are still on board, not only here on Z in Zoom, but also in Facebook Live and YouTube Live during this webinar series for the content and course modules for different disciplines under the new modalities through the efforts of Leyte Normal University and the Palumpon Institute of Technology. After this, Eastern Visayas will soon have a prepared online and printed module. For the technology infrastructure and support, the consortium has designed the following flowchart through the leadership of Summer State University through President Marlin Cardoso and the Eastern Visaya State University through President Tumedor Aguirre. One, the full offline preparation. This is designed for those with no internet access and no available gadgets and can be implemented by establishing LGU links and queues, use of courier services and broadcast facilities. 
Second, the online blended preparation. This is designed for those with internet access or limited internet access by using a model-based LMS. Under this preparation, provisions and support for both faculty members and students shall be considered to ensure smooth implementation of blended and online platform. As we navigate through the implementation of this consortium, a series of assessments will be conducted by the University of Eastern Philippines headed by President Cherry Ultra and, in, and the Nav Northwest Summer State University through President, to President Picayo rather, particularly on the training and capacity building in answering the needs of the faculty members and their use on the flexible learning. Moreover, the consortium is likewise bound with the necessary mechanisms for the operationalization and sustainability of the FLMS consortium of EBHEIs under the new normal. Upon implementation, BIPSU and ESSU take charge in documenting and reviewing the policies related to FLMS being implemented by different academic institutions and organizations. Crafting policies and agreements that is dynamic and tailor fitted to the needs of the FLMS consortium of EVHEIs under the new learning environment and evaluating the effectiveness and efficiency of the policies and agreements implemented in the FLMS consortium of EVHEIs. As the interim chairperson of the EBHEI's FLMS consortium, we assure you that we are one with you in ensuring the success and sustainability of this project, which we believe is a major breakthrough in the disaster risk reduction policies and strategies of Eastern Visayas. It does not only operationalize during the time of the COVID-19 pandemic, but will also be used in the future, even when the pandemic subsides. Although today marks the end of the week-long webinar series on course module production, we are now expected to work during the upcoming two week production break. With your support and commitment towards ensuring quality delivery of education amidst this pandemic, I believe that we will heal as one and learn as one. Hence, we hope that by August 24 of this year, 2020, Eastern Visayas is already prepared under the new normal in education. Keep safe and God bless Eastern Visayas. Thank you very much, Dr. Caniezo of Bipsu. It was a very comprehensive update on the EVHEI's FLMST. Okay, thank you. So, coming up next, uh, let me quote St. Ignatius of Loyola. He wrote, saying, It is not sufficient to do our part well, it must be done more than well. Coming up next are some words of encouragement, like setting our direction, thus driving us to where we are heading. In short, these are valuable inputs on ways forward. To do this, we have Dr. George Colorado, Shed Region 8 Director. Thank you, Diane. Am I heard clearly? Okay, Bako. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Not very, very loud. 
but not also so. Um, to our uh, missioner, missioner Darilag, and uh, to the presidents of our SUCs in the region. And to everyone, good afternoon. Yung uh, mga dapat nating gagawin was already mentioned by the last two speakers, si Dr. Olavides and uh, Dr. Cañeso. They have already outlined our directions uh, within the next days. After this uh, theoretical uh, trainings, we have to produce something because that is really our objective. Parang, uh, if we are going to learn how to bake, the proof of that is the cake. We have to have something when the school year opens in August. So, uh, probably we are 33% uh, of the way uh, along the journey. The next things that should happen would be we look forward for the approval of our project uh, proposal at the CHED central office. The amount was uh, mentioned by uh, uh, Dr. Cañeso, something around 82 million. We don't know how much will be approved, but uh, we believe something will be approved. And this is uh, for the training. And as we do our trainings, we will be producing the modules. We will be teaching the faculty how to undertake the development of the modules for each of the programs that we have for each of the campuses. And then uh, we have to test these things as uh, was uh, mentioned by uh, Dr. Olabide sometime in July when we have some things, we have to look at it, test it, and revise it if necessary. So those things will have to happen. And then uh, after that, of course, we uh, would look at this as the beginning of our region wide uh, capability building. Because as of now, this is just for the SUCs. And uh, we still have the private HEIs in our region, which, uh, of course, also need these things. We are fortunate in the government that uh, we take the lead in developing these things. And then uh, we help the private HEIs HEI to also uh, be ready for the new normal that we are facing. So. There are also other things that are developing. For example, the CHED Central Office will be launching the Philippine CHED Connect on June 23, uh, 2020, of course, uh, next week. The purpose of that is to put together all the available OERs. Uh, outsourcing of educational resources. It will be a portal that will be launched and there are many contributors so that modules will already be available and the faculty members the, of the, our SQCs from different campuses will be able to access those things. There were promises to uh, the chair that uh, there are some uh, institutions like uh, UP Open University will give all their modules there so that uh, other schools can make use of these things. So this will happen. And also in our region, we are being asked to contribute to beef up these modules for everyone else to, uh, to make use of. Marong nagtanong yan, what's in it? for the HEIs to contribute voluntarily the modules that they have developed and worked hard for, and the others will just be going in and eat the cake. You know, 
questions like this. We don't, we are not businessmen. We are not in the, academy is not in the business of making profit, but making sure that uh, we are developing and forging ahead, creating new lands, creating new areas, so that those who will be following us will benefit from it. We do not expect to be paid or to benefit from their benefits, but only to the joy of having in our hearts and in our minds that we did something so that someone who is following us will benefit from it and also develop the character that they too will do something so that those who are following them will have something to benefit from them as well. So we are doing this because uh, we know that it is important for the development of our economy, especially in these trying moments. So we have to move forward and we have a lot of things to do. Uh, we expect that the uh, sectors would group together. Yung mga agriculture faculty members will group together. Different sectors of that sector will group together and develop something and contribute that not only to our region, but also to the portals of the CHED so that this can be used by others. You will be recognized, you will be credited, your modules that you have presented, the PowerPoints and all these uh, uh, course materials that are contributed there will be credited to whomever who have contributed it. And that is our role in the higher education institution. We develop knowledge, not for the sake of benefiting for it because we are not in business, but because we are moving forward for we are the forgers of development in our community, in our country. With that, we look forward for more works and we congratulate the works that have been done by this committee. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you. That was the Rector Colorado of CHED Region 8. That was indeed very challenging. Also, of course, very inspiring, sir. Okay. So Eastern Visayas, we are down to the last part of this closing program. Now, Dr. Jude A. Duarte, President of the Leyden Normal University and the Chair of the Content Development Committee will have his closing message. Uh, Dr. Aldrin uh, A. Darilag, Commissioner of uh, Commission on Higher Education, Director George Colorado, Chad Region 8, Dr. Norberto Olavides, President of Palumpon Institute of Technology, Co-Chair of Content Development Committee, Dr. Uh, Victor Agneso, President of IPSU and Interim President of uh, or Chair of our Consortium, Dr. Dominador Aguirre of EBSU, Dr. Pros I.B. Yepes of SLSU, Dr. Marilyn Cardoso of SSSU, University officials of different SOOCs in Region 8, participants, members of the uh, content group, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Again, in behalf of uh, the nine SOOCs in the region, allow me to convey our thanks to uh, uh, Commissioner, a, Commissioner Aldrin Darilag for his leadership in coming up with the capacity building initiatives relative to flexible learning. The series of webinars starting with trainings and then content has indeed cast away doubts and uncertainties as to our readiness to roll out flexible learning. It gave us a lot of insights and inputs on how to deliver these new modalities to our students in response to the pressing needs to come up with alternative modes. Let me congratulate the content group members of which coming from the different SOOCs in the region for managing well 
the webinars and for conceptualizing and defending the content proposal in the chat panel in a very, very limited time. For uh, wisely and meticulously choosing experts on different topics, no doubt they have unselfishly shared their knowledge. To Professor Jerry Arita from PNU, Dr. Jesse Barut, Dean of College of Education and Arts and Sciences of National University, Dr. Marilo Obinia of PNU, Director Aaron Almadro, Dr. Juan Robertino Macalde, Dr. Marlene Balagtas of PNU, and Dr. Robbie Marlina just this afternoon. To other folks who shared their inputs in the formulation of this content course, thank you very much. To the university presidents who always gave their 100% support for this project, to CHED Region 8, headed by Dr. Director George Colorado, to the panel members who meticulously critiqued the entire proposal, which resulted to a very comprehensive response to a flexible learning needs. To the participants, patient enough to listen and interact with our resource speakers and co-participants, even with an intermittent signal, and oftentimes with the unnecessary embarrassing interruptions caused by our unfamiliarity of the Zoom platform. Thank you very much for your participation. My friends, Chad invested a lot in this project, but I'm very sure the result of investment will be enormous. Uh, on our part, we invest our time as well as time as well. So I hope this capacity building initiative will not go to waste. Uh, rather, we, we will expose more ways to face these new challenges, to shift gears from a teaching-centered to a student-centered way of imparting knowledge. From the usual residential to flexible learning modes, we have no choice but to enhance or to embrace this new development in the academy. Thank you very much and good luck to all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much of Dr. Duarte from the Leyden Normal University and the chair of the Content Development Committee. Members of the Eastern Visayas Higher Education Institutions Flexible Learning Management System Consortium, participants, organizers, trainers, ladies and gentlemen, that formally ends our engagement in the training workshop on course modules production for flexible learning in higher education institutions. In closing, let me quote Mother Teresa who said, let no one ever come to you without living him or her better and happier. Have a safe and wonderful day ahead, everybody. God bless Eastern Visayas, God bless our land, and God ever bless us all. Thank you, everyone. And let me remind everybody that the attendance is now on your screen. Goodbye and take care. Bye and congratulations to the committee. Bye bye. Thank you, Dr. George, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President. Yes, sir. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you, my teachers. Thank you, Dr. Gilly, Dr. Julian, Dr. Kamputo. We have to meet after this. Yes, yes. Dr. Cañeso may be calling a meeting to update us. Yes, sir. We will inform you maybe by Monday. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Congratulations and uh, thank you for this seminar series.
successful. Thank you for the support, RD Colorado and Commissioner Darilag. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, RD. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Let's Aldrin. Say, thank you, yeah. Sir. Thank you, President TFS, <laughs> President Cardoso. Thank oh. you to the three lady beauties presidents. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jude. Yes, Thank sir. Uh, okay, bye bye. We still bye. have so many bye. things to do. Take care. Yeah, stay safe, everyone. Stay home. Stay in the office. <laughs> Thank you, Sir Andre. Ah, Dr. Aguirre. Thank bye you, bye, sir. Bye, bye. Thank you very much, too. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.